Good evening. On behalf of the Elizabethtown Area School District, we extend a warm welcome to our in-person attendees and virtual viewers. Leading the 2024 workshop session will be Mr. Stephen Limden Booth, Board President, and Dr. Karen Nell, School District Superintendent. For our in-person attendees, any individual wishing to address the school directors during the public comment portion of the meeting must complete a yellow card in full and submit it to the board secretary by 7 p.m. A designated drop box is available at the front of the auditorium for your convenience. If the public comment period ends before the registration deadline, the public comment segment of the agenda shall be deemed adjourned. For our virtual viewers, you are participating in a Zoom webinar meeting which provides view only access. As a friendly reminder, this board meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the district's YouTube channel for a period of one year. Thank you for your interest in the Elizabethtown Area School District. I will now turn things over to Mr. Lindeby to conduct the meeting. All right, we'd like to call to order the meeting tonight. Uh, we welcome you. Thank you for coming. Uh, we know that uh, summer is quickly approaching. Um, just a reminder that we meet we have two meetings here this month in June, and then for the month of July, we will be uh, taking a, a break, so to speak. We have an off month as a board, and then you're free to join us again back in August. So again, two meetings this month, uh, tonight and the 25th, and then also uh, <clears throat> meetings will resume the second Tuesday of August. So that reminder, um, also I, want to congratulate all of our graduates. Uh, we just had graduation last week on Tuesday night, and I believe we had 300 graduates approximately. And uh, our, our congratulations go out to them. Uh, my, my daughter was quick to alert me to the fact that uh, on a light note here, apparently I said class of 2004 at the end of my speech. So I apologize for that. I want to apologize to the class of 2024. I did check the tape. I did say 2024 at the beginning of the speech, though. So I don't know. Somewhere along the line, I lost 20 years there until the end of the speech. So I apologize to the class of 2024. Try not to uh, let that happen again. Um, so without, uh, with, that, with all things considered, I believe we're ready uh, to start our meeting. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, Mrs. Maxwell, just uh, for the, for time's sake, uh, let it be noted that all board members are present. All right, hopefully you had a chance to look over the agenda. Um, do we have a motion to accept tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to accept the agenda. Are there any... Uh, questions about that? Comments? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Uh, agenda is approved. Superintendent's announcements, Dr. Nell. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as I mentioned last month, this month we are celebrating our June Elizabethtown Rotary Club Students of the Month. Um, so this is a program that celebrates and recognizes student achievement and raises the awareness of their contributions to our high school community. So they were here last time because, of course, they've graduated since then, but we do want to honor Michaela Condren and Nathan Merlo tonight. Michaela is the daughter of Matthew and Aaron Condren of Elizabethtown, and she has consistently showcased exceptional academic aptitude and leadership throughout her high school journey. Notably, her commitment to scholarship, character, leadership, and service earned her induction into the esteemed T.H. Ebersole chapter of the National Honor Society. Michaela's academic excellence was prominently recognized at past underclass awards programs. She garnered praise for her outstanding performance in honors biology, German II, and competition science, underscoring her prowess in diverse subject areas. Michaela's fervor for science radiated throughout her involvement with the high school's competition science team. Her achievements included clinching the title of senior reserve champion for her project in chemistry and material science categories, as well as securing a third place award for her project in the energy category at the North Museum Science and Engineering Fair. 
Additionally, her awards extended to the Science Olympiad, where she was a three-time regional medalist in forensics and green generation, qualifying for the state competition. Beyond academics, while a student here, Michaela was actively immersed in extracurricular pursuits, such as the Key Club, Human Rights Club, and Reading Olympics. Notably, her, her leadership skills were evident as she captained the Lancaster Lebanon League Section 2 champion field hockey team. Her stellar performance on the field earned her numerous accolades, including the Big E Booster Club Offensive MVP in 2022 and 2023, League Lancaster Lebanon League Section 2 All-Star and Academic Team All-Star, Lancaster Lebanon All-Star Academic All-State Team, and Second Team All-State. In addition to her academic and extracurricular commitments, Michaela also contributes to her community through her employment with Condren's Landscaping and her dedication to pet sitting. So looking ahead this summer, Michaela is poised to embark on her next chapter at Williams College, where she intends to major in biochemistry or in environmental science while continuing her passion for field hockey. So let's have a round of applause for Michaela Condra. Our other Rotary Student of the Month uh, is Nathan Merlot. Nathan is the son of Peter and Kathy Merlot, and he has consistently showcased exceptional academic prowess, prowess and leadership throughout his high school journey. He was also inducted into the prestigious T.H. Ebersole chapter of the National Honor Society, and with a remarkable 4.0 GPA, he ranks among the top 10 students in his class. Beyond academics, Nathan is deeply involved in various extracurricular activities, including the concert and marching band, orchestra, model UN, and key club. And as an active member of the key club, he dedicated himself to serving the community through numerous projects. Additionally, Nathan contributes his talent to the cross country and track and field teams, displaying his commitment to both physical fitness and teamwork. Outside of school, you might see Nathan at the local subway um, in Elizabethtown. He is also an active member of Hope Community Church in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania, and participates in the youth group at Crossroads Brethren in Christ Church, where he engages in meaningful community and faith-based activities. So looking ahead for him this summer, Nathan has set his sights on pursuing a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity at the Rochester Institute of Technology. So congratulations to Nathan. For the second part of my announcements this evening, I'd like to uh, just give a quick summary of some of our spring sports highlights. Our boys tennis team finished with a 310 record. Aaron McBride qualified for the Lancaster Lebanon League Championships. Our boys lacrosse team had a 117 record. Lancaster Lebanon League second team all stars included Carter Ketchum and Holden Haver. Our girls lacrosse team finished 9 9. Danielle Bruno scored her 183rd goal, becoming the school's all-time leading scorer. Lancaster Lebanon League first team all-stars included Danielle Bruno, Josie Spade, Piper Patrick, and Charlie Langel Kramer. The boys volleyball team finished 7-9 and unfortunately did not make the playoffs. Um, LL League all-stars included Cooper Torberg, Seth Racknick, Prabin Bahari, and PIAA. District 3 honorable mention went to Cooper Torberg. The baseball team finished 11, 8, and 1 and qualified for the PIAA District 3 playoffs as the 15th seed, unfortunately losing to Mechanicsburg 6-0 in the first round. And the softball team finished 14-6. They were the Section 2 runner-up and lost to Northern Lebanon 4-3 in the Lancaster Lebanon League playoffs. They qualified for the PIAA District 3 playoffs, losing to Solanco 11-4 in the first round. Lancaster Lebanon first team all-stars included Ava Fair, Aston Kalaman, Kira Davis, <clears throat> Leah Aldis, and Chloe Wilkinson. The track and field team is also to be commended for their amazing attitude during this very unique season when they did not have a home track to practice on. We're very appreciative of their flexibility and their school spirit. The boys team finished 4-2 and the girls 
Several individuals qualified for the PIAA District 3 track and field meet and the PIAA state track and field meet. At districts, Anna Rank placed third in the pole vault. Jebba and Goffwu placed sixth in the triple jump. Ali Fink placed seventh in the 1600 meter run. Colin Rallot placed seventh in shot put and Jason Conrad placed eighth in the 3,200 meter run. At the PIAA state meet, Anna Rank placed fifth in pole vault while Ali Fink and Jason Conrad were state qualifiers. So as Mr. Lindemuth mentioned earlier, we did celebrate graduation last week with our annual commencement program at LCBC. A total of 280 seniors received their diplomas. So we want to wish them our congratulations. Especially we'd like to note that it was a special moment for some of our board members and their families who presented diplomas to their daughters and for Mrs. Shrum who presented to her granddaughter. We also want to commend and thank all of our parents and guardians for their partnership and support throughout this journey. If you did miss the ceremony, you can watch the recording on our YouTube channel. So now that we have wrapped up the 2023-24 school year, we head into our summer work. And yes, there is a lot of work that happens in the summer getting ready for the fall, and it's started already. Our buildings and ground staff are diligently preparing our facilities for the new school year. Our teachers have been working on numerous professional development opportunities. Our administrators are completing interviews for new faculty and staff and finalizing schedules, as well as preparing student classroom assignments and arranging for transportation. And our athletic coaches are coordinating off-season workouts in anticipation of the upcoming school year. So in closing, we do hope that everyone has the opportunity to regroup and relax this summer. So that concludes my announcements for this evening. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nell. Appreciate that. We will start the uh, business session now uh, with committee items. So the first committee on, on board is facilities. And I will yield our time to Mr. Emery. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight we're gonna uh, have a uh, field health and turf field uh, update by Fidavia. Uh, I'm welcoming uh, Mr. English from Fidavia, um, Mr. Templin, our athletic director, and Mr. Franz, uh, which is our uh, director of operations to give us an update and a presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. There we go. Everyone hear me? Um, for those who may not remember who I am, my name is Kelvin English. I work with Fidavia. Uh, we were hired by the district to be your uh, construction manager and owner's representative for the field house and turf project. A few of you were able to go on a tour this afternoon prior to the meeting. I appreciate those who were able to make it. And those who couldn't, we welcome you anytime on the job site. <clears throat> so I'm here to give a quick update and I will keep it quick. I know you have a busy agenda tonight. Uh, what we have accomplished since I've last been here and what we're going to count, accomplish over the summer until we're near our completion in August and September. I'll start off with some bad news. As the board may know, and what we want to let the public know, our main electrical panel has been delayed. It was supposed to ship this week, actually. It's now set to ship beginning of August. So while the building itself will be a little bit behind, we're shooting for a late September completion, the field and turf will be ready for the start of the fall sports season. That being said, since we've last been here, the building is now all the way complete, all the way built, you know, all three stories, exterior block. We have our roof steel on. We're getting ready for a roof install, which should be occurring in the next two weeks. We are starting the veneer on the building and they are making quick progress. Masons are doing a great job and within two weeks, they should be completed, completed with the veneer as well. The ground floor and first floor have all been completed with the interior walls. When, and on rainy days, our carpenters are working inside getting those ceilings built. Our MEPs, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment is being installed above ceiling and in the boiler room on the first and ground floor with the second floor getting started this week. As it comes to the field, the visitor bleachers are 95% complete. We are just waiting for the uh, 
ramps and stairs to access the bleachers. The turf is prepped, and we're actually going to be starting our turf install next Wednesday, weather permit. The paving of the track will occur in July, and with the surfacing occurring right before the start of the season. Um, and as the turf is finishing up, we'll be installing features such as the field goal post, the ball bearer netting, and everything like that. So that's a quick update of where we're at on the project. By August, we'll be nearing complete. The field will be ready to go, and the building will be coming along quite nicely to be ready for that September occupancy. Uh, any question for the board members? Just had one question that about uh, the stadium lights and the scoreboard, are those things all going to be functional by August? Yes, they will. Okay, so it's basically just the building yes. itself that has the electrical issue. Yes, everything that is currently on the field and the new features such as time clocks, the relocated scoreboard, your existing stadium lights are fed from the existing maintenance concession building. All that will be, most of that electrical work is completed. We're waiting for final ties and we'll make sure that all that is ready to go for the first game, which is August 30th. Okay, thanks. So just just FYI, um, what uh, what we're speaking about here is what's inside your electrical panel in your house is what's missing in our field house, just times 10 in size. Um, it's the it's the breakers. It's 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 a three phase, and uh, um, that is what's missing. Um, we do have temp power. We are we are going forward. You can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but we are going forward. We're able to assemble our our elevator, uh, all the things that are necessary. Um, the only reason we won't have an occupancy certificate is because uh, PP and L has to do their final. And they can't do their final until we have that that box in place. So to build on that, that panel, the inner side of that panel ships. It's tentative to ship beginning of August. About a week to get it from El Paso, then we'll start installing it. In the meantime, the electricians have the what we call the back box, which is that box the panel sits in, and they're piping that in with the conduit, pulling as much wire as they can. So when that panel does arrive, it cuts down on the time required to get the building ready to go on. Now. That being said, it's not going to be quick, slap it, and we're done. We still then have to finish the elevator install because we can only go so far without permanent power. Get the equipment up and running, the rooftop units for HVAC, the fire alarm system, security system, all that will have final programs. So that's what eats us into September. But all our, so far, all but one of our subcontractors with the finishes have agreed to work under temporary power. We're just waiting by in for the last one, which should not be an issue. I just want to commend you. Um, we've we've had a lot of rain. Um, I think I heard top 10 uh, record in history um, for the state of PA or South Central PA. Uh, so I, I commend you guys on on making progress during the mud. They're, they're doing their best out there. They do all the work. I just watch it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. You folks have a great evening. Enjoy your summer and graduate to the class of 2024. Uh, the next item I have uh, for tonight and the final item I have is, is facility rental agreement. Um, and just so you guys have a quick history on that, uh, we we discovered that this thing hasn't been looked at since about 1992, and so we wanted to make sure that um, you know our 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 due diligence was taken in in making sure that the upgrades to the fees uh, were happening. Um, again, this hadn't been looked at in decades. So um, I do know that uh, um, Mrs. Lindemuth had a couple of questions, um, and I would invite and open that up for the rest of the board if you have any questions on this uh, on this item. Uh, yes, the one thing that I noted, um, and I wanna say thank you for updating this. Absolutely love the fact that we are revisiting this, um, that we have the different classes on here. But um, I 
did notice that in under the additional fees, it doesn't designate who would be um, responsible to pay the additional fees. The way that it is structured now, um, to me, it looks like just Class C would pay those additional fees. But I thought it was that we were planning to have all of the um, classes do that. So my suggestion would be to add some wording in there to indicate that it is all three, if that is the case. Yeah, well noted. I'm going to turn that over to Tom. And and can you have anything to uh, speak into that, Tom? Uh, that would be a board decision that if you tell us that you want everyone to pay for fees, that's what we'll do. I think in, historically that has not been E-Town's case. E-Town has picked up costs for nonprofit organizations. Uh, so therefore, if E-Town has pays custodial fees, nonprofits didn't pay, didn't reimburse the district. So we were paying for them to use our facility. Mr. Emery and the facilities committee had indicated to us that he wanted that change. But I think that I'd like to hear from all of you to tell us what, to, give us direction and we'll put whatever you want on. Yeah, it, it is my opinion um, that uh, the only fees that would be inquired, uh, acquired by uh, by the classes other than Class C uh, would be the custodial, uh, custodial fees, um, the cleanup. Um, our guys need to get paid and uh, um, they're not making $15 an hour anymore. So um, yeah, that's, that's just my mind thought on that. I, I, I'll kick that to the rest of the board as to what you guys might. Just to clarify, think. is it just the custodial fees or all additional fees? Because there are several things that are under additional fees that are more than just the custodial fees. Um, in my mind, it was just, it was just custo custodial. Because there's custodial fees, technician fees, fees um, will be charged for additional equipment requested on a per day or hourly basis. And these items include, but are not limited to risers, projectors, pianos, sound systems, and it goes on from there. Again, I'll 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 uh, pass this to the board for a board decision. Um, do we need to put that on an agenda for a vote? The agreement for itself would be voted on on the twenty fifth. So, if you'd like us to revise the document, you can have a consensus amongst yourselves. If you want Mr. Strickler to revise that in preparation for the twenty fifth, you don't have to vote on this tonight. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I will open that up to a consensus vote. Um, thoughts, suggestions, comments? Yeah, I had, <clears throat> now keep in mind, four years ago, gears were paying for some things and, and, uh, that has went away now, but back when they were doing that, they were renting out our areas or fields and collecting the money and we didn't see any of it. So that's why the, the, the way the, the board had taken for gear is kind of a pull out. My question is that I'm okay with gears, not having to pay as long as it's people in our own district. If it's groups that are outside our district, like Group C, it's gear shouldn't be able to, you know, let them come in underneath their folder. If if I'm trying to say that correctly, so Tom, if you, you if you understand what I'm saying, meaning that Group A and B, it has three groups: A, B, and C. C is outside district they they're the ones getting the highest fees and my my question is that them outside groups aren't coming in under a and a and b because they kind of um, orchestrated it At this time, Gears does not cost the district any money because they do all custodial and they take care of the entry and exit. So there's no fees at all that the district would be picking up for Gears. And that's why what I heard from you at one of the committee meetings is that Gears would not be charged. However, they are under the impression that should they require the district to have custodial technician fees or anything else that the district has to pay for, 
they will pay as well. But my question is how it's structured through through gears is that let's say there's a group from New York that wants to come down there. They can't put an underneath their group. It has to be just what gears offers through them. Okay. Um, maybe I'm going crazy here, but did, did, wasn't there under the old agreement four classes? There were still four classes. It's I thought there was a, a, I thought there was a class. D. Okay. It says Sunday use. I'm not seeing a class D anymore. Is that, facilities, has that changed? The facilities committee recommended that we consolidate C and D so that any organization outside of Elizabethtown area school district, whether they're for-profit or non-profit will be charged. So if anything inside Elizabethtown school district, that's non-profit will not be charged. I apologize. I was looking at the old form. I've got both of them in front of me here. Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm basically of the opinion that what's presented here is pretty good. I think A and B, if we just charge them the custodial fees, I think that's adequate. I think I'm okay, pretty much okay with the way it's written. So we're not looking to charge the technician fees? Because if we're having to pay somebody a technician, pay a technician to be here, wouldn't we also charge a technician fee? My suggestion would be that we would have the no charge for A and B for the facility use, but additional fees because it is a cost to the district would be incurred by whoever is um, outside the district that would be utilizing those services. Because A is the district, correct? So class A would not incur those charges. It would just be class B, which is your nonprofits and your local people. They would be the one in addition to class C that would um, incur additional fees should they utilize them, custodial, technician, and if they use any of our um, our additional equipment. Uh, uh, yeah, I am I am of that opinion, uh, Mrs. Lindemuth. Um, I think uh, um, you know we have we have historically been at the bottom of the barrel with this since ninety two. Um, if you look at Lancaster County, we are the absolute cheapest, or we were until we we implemented, we found this and implemented it, um, or are implementing it. Uh, we were absolute bottom of the barrel cheapest, and we also had people like you heard from Miss Mr. Uh, Riggleman over here. Um, we had people that were coming in to rent our facilities and finding, you know, John Smith that lived in the district and having him fill out the paperwork because he lived in the district. And so they would get the discounted rates even though they were outside the district. And so we're putting a stop to all of that. Um, I do agree that uh, any additional costs uh, should be concurred uh, by, by class B as well as C. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have to pay for things. Um, and I think those those additional costs should be consumed by by those that are renting. All right. So do we have a general consensus there with B and C? Does that seem to be the? I just wanted to clarify. You said though, gears if they rent our facilities, they will pay that additional fee if they need a custodian. Right now, they don't. But reviewing class a it does have school district ptos booster clubs and gears um i mean for the most part most of them would not use the additional they usually provide their own um i think to make it across the board it would just be if there's additional fees correct yeah do we have a consensus on that Okay, you're hearing a consensus. Yep, so we'll revise the document and post it for your vote for the 25th. <laughs> thank you, and I'll, with that, I'll turn that back over to the president. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Emery. Uh, we will move on now to uh, Educational Planning and Student Services Committee. 
uh, to Mrs. Carter. Okay, hopefully you got a chance to look over that survey. That's for one of our teachers um, to do some doctoral research. Um, she's hoping to get that out over the summer. Um, and this is just to help um, improve differentiated instruction in the ELA department. Um, so there's 12 questions um, they can, the kids can answer always, often, sometimes, rarely, never. Um, and they're pretty basic questions about their programming at school. Um, and then the parent letter will be sent out and actually now has a link within it um, that will send them right to the survey so they can review the questions um, before their students receive that email if they'd like to. So any questions about that? It's available to the public. Can they see that on their agendas? Sorry. Do you mean can the survey? On the agenda that they that was put out by the school to survey yeah it's only in the administrative content at the moment yeah i just wanted to say that um yeah i saw this one with mrs carter and again i'm not a big fan of surveys but this one's pretty innocuous it's all just about um school basically um and there's nothing weird in it that's all i had to say thank you any other questions Okay, that'll be on the list for the June 25th meeting then to vote on, okay? All right, quick and simple there. Uh, moving on to finance committee items. We have uh, several things here as always, so we will uh, discuss those. Ms. Mrs. Lindemuth, go ahead. All right, we will not be quick and simple, unfortunately, um, but I am going to um, hand the budget presentation over to Mr. Strickler. Thank you, Mr. Lindenbooth. Uh, next slide. We'll go through, uh, many of you have sent me questions from either yourselves or the community uh, and asked that we answer them. And we felt that the best way to do it so that everybody heard the same responses was in a presentation. So taking some of yours, maybe modified some of the wording because they sort of fit with the same question that was asked before the comment. Some of these are more comments than questions and I hope I can answer and now you nine can also ask questions at the same time. I would ask that you ask as we go and try not to wait till the end and then say I forgot what I was gonna ask on the second slide. So please ask and I'll try to give you as much detail as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna do a real quick review for you. So it's awful hard to remember five weeks ago when you uh, approved a preliminary budget. Next slide. So the first one is the revenue. Keep going, thank you. Uh, re the revenue is the exact same that you all have seen since uh, I think about uh, February uh, that we worked with. There is one line that is always modified. And I, I continue to get the question as the outcomes you see, every time you see this, I change the numbers. Uh, it is not because I'm trying to hide anything from you. And I please let me be real upfront. These are transparent. The numbers change because your assessment changes. I try to use the current assessment at the time that I'm giving this presentation to you. Before the budget purposes, we must use the June 1st assessment. If you notice the numbers have changed, they've gone down. Your assessment in E-Town has gone down. I don't have anything to do with it and I can't change it. I strictly go by what comes out of the local assessment office. Now, unlucky for them, at the same time they sent it out, the next day the county government office is flooded and therefore we haven't been able to ask any questions. So we really haven't gotten anything. The numbers are correct. There really wasn't any questions to ask them. So the real estate tax number changed and the state revenue line changes and that changes based on Farmstead Homestead, which is based on the actual numbers that we get. So those two numbers have changed since the April meeting. That's the only two revenue numbers that have changed. Next slide, please. So based on that, we have had a little bit of modification of the current averages. It's still basically the same. Uh, the, the amount of the assessment that changed is so minimal based on the total number, the total dollars assessed at E-Town School District. Next slide then goes to the uh, Total expenses and the revenue for three, three and a half, and uh, 3.75, excuse me. Now, one of the things that I want to point out, and I'm trying to be as transparent as possible to you board members to have to make a tough decision. I understand it's a tough decision. Ms. Carter, I thank you for your question today. I'm going to use the response. One of the concerns I have, if you look at 
the April 30th PDE general budget form. This is the one that the first one on April 30th was signed by Mr. Lindemuth. The one now still says he signed a preliminary, but we'll have to get him to sign the final before it actually can go in. If you look at these, the revenue numbers have changed based on what I just told you. Local revenue has gone down uh, and state revenue has gone up. Local revenue has gone down by $891,310 and state revenue has gone up by $153,549 which, which is a net decrease of $737,761. Farmstead, Homestead. We will get reimbursed, but that's the changes. I have to show you what actually is coming from local, what actually is coming from state. Okay, so it's not, it's not a hat trick or anything like that. It's strictly, that's the numbers that changed. If you also look at the PDE form, the total expense dollars have not moved. They're exactly the same that I reported to you April 30th that we're reporting tonight. The total expense that we're reporting is $82,010,958. That's the budget that I'm reporting to you this evening. And that's the budget that I reported to you April 30th. Why is the number on this slide 79,000 or 79 million? Big difference. First of all, the board in March of 23, approved two construction items, a $7 million fund balance to be moved to construction during the 23-24 year, which we did. $2 million to be moved during the 24-25 year, which is in this budget. You don't need local or state revenue to pay that 2 million. That's coming from your fund balance as approved by motion of the board. So therefore, let's take that out. You don't need revenue to cover that next year. It's already been covered. So that takes it down to down to eighty million three hundred forty eight thousand four hundred forty eight dollars. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. It takes it down to eighty million. Uh, yeah, I lost my number. Ten thousand nine hundred fifty eight dollars. Two deductions that we took from that at the direction of the finance committee and also of you. There was two things in next year's budget that we're not doing. Uh, one of them we've already taken care of out of this year's budget for $125,000. Second one, we are not filling a position for $125,000. And the third one, we purchased software this year for $55,000. Those three things takes your expense for next year to $79,705,948. It's not a hat trick. It's not trying to fake you out. It is strictly the actual number we have to cover with revenue. It, I, it, I think it's not fair to you guys to see 82 million there when we already have some of it covered. So that's the actual number that we must cover in, unless you change your mind it, that you want something cut other than that. So next slide, please. Let's get off of those two. That's the review. Any questions on that before I move? You all good with that? Clear? Okay, next. Citizen comment. Question, <clears throat> the district has exceeded its revenue for each of the last three years. Each fiscal year since 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, the district has generated over 100% of actual revenue compared to budgeted revenue. The board should not have to raise taxes as other revenue sources will make up the difference. The answer, all revenue lines with the exception of the property tax are estimated every year. Pennsylvania budget, we all know, is not going to be passed by June 30th. So we will not know what the Pennsylvania budget is gonna give us in either special ed or regular ed. All other lines are a guess. How much interest earnings are we gonna get? What's the interest rate gonna be for the year? How many people are gonna sell their homes in, in Elizabethtown area that we're gonna get transfer tax? How many people are gonna be working this year? Is it gonna be a good year? Un the unemployment gonna be low, unemployment gonna be high, which then changes our earned income tax. All of these are guesstimates based on prior years but every one of them were either going to go over or under. So we really, it, it's a great year when we always go over our budget because it's a bad year if we come in all numbers under budget. We're then going to be scrambling for how do we pay for everything. It's really the answer in words. Let's look at it in, in uh, parts. Next slide. 
So what I tried to do is to give you a couple of years to compare. So 23, 24, again, we're not complete. We're sort of in the midst of it. This is through May 31st. If you look at the blue highlights going down, you see that we're over budget in investment earnings. That's because we all know interest rates have been nice and high. We're over budget in basic ed. The state gave us more money than, they, than we thought. We're over budget in special ed. State gave us more money than what we thought. However, look at the subsidies benefit. We're at 47% of what we thought. If we go down to federal reimbursement, we're at 3% of what we thought we were getting from the federal government. So again, you see the wide swings that we're guessing. I mean, we're trying to do a, a educated guess based on history, based on what the governor has told us for the state. But again, the federal government, if they pass a budget, it doesn't come till October. We're way ahead. We're guessing what's going to happen in October. So if we go to the next slide, I'll just give you a couple years to look at. 22-23 was a great year. We had all kind of over budget earnings, earned income tax, investment earnings, transfer tax, basic ed, special ed, subsidies, subsidies benefits. We were still at 95%. We still weren't over. Our grants were over. Our stimulus money, as you know, they gave us the nice uh, ESSER money for the last couple of years was over budget. But again, the reimbursement was at 30%. Next slide. We'll just get, you can look at this at your, as you see fit. But again, each year we're budgeting, coming in over budget. But if you really look at the economy since 2020, 2021, the economy has been booming. That's why the Federal Reserve keeps increasing interest rates because they're trying to slow it down. But as long as the economy keeps booming, unemployment's low, we're getting more earned income tax. You know what the real estate market's looking like in Lancaster County right now. You can't keep a house in the market for more than a week and it's gone and it's gone for more than what people are asking for, which means our tra which is good for us because the transfer tax is coming in much higher than anticipated. However, at this point in time, all of us at the table, it's a guess what's going to happen between now and June 30th, 2025. So in your mind, as a board approving a budget, you want to see these blue numbers every year because you don't want the superintendent and I coming back to you and saying uh, it's January and we're not getting the income and revenue that we anticipated. We need to freeze. That's not a good sign. So it's really a positive to come in over budget in your revenues, not expenses over budget and revenues. So I gave you these uh, four years. The next slide's the same thing in 2021. And you see, I mean, the stimulus came in at 339% over budget, way up there. And it's just, everybody was pumping money into school districts to help you out. Yes, sir. Excuse me, with these extra blue numbers and all the supposed uh, budget surplus here, what do we do with that? Does that hold, can you hold that for the next section? I'll be glad to help you. Yes, it's it's fund balance, and that's okay. what we're going to do with it. And I just want to show you where we are with the fund balance. But that's basically what happens is once you approve a budget, it's the expense part that's approved and the revenue that's approved. Unless the board tells directs the administration or the administration comes to the board and says, we'd like to change the expense we want to hire an additional person or we want to purchase something that's not capital re capital assets. It's just something that's a curriculum or whatever. The board has to approve going over budget in an expense category. Uh, there may be times that I come to the board and say, we went over budget in this expense category, but we're going to be under budget here. I need a budget transfer, which you're familiar with. So, from that standpoint, any over budget and expenses, the district, the administration needs to come to the board. If we plan to go over, we need to come to you. If it's something that is unplanned, the utility, you know, next year, we've already heard UGI is going up 10%. That is not in this year's budget. I did not expect UGI to go up 10%. So those type of things, I'm going to have to come to you potentially for a budget transfer from somewhere else. Okay, so that's, it drops to the bottom line. It may pay extra in expenses. It may be in the fund balance, which we'll explain in the next section. Okay. Any other questions on the revenue pieces? Next slide. So the next question, and I should pay Mr. Gillis to lead me right into this, uh, is on fund balance. Uh, the fund balance is high enough and should be used instead of tax increases. 
Fund balance is the answer is fund balance is used to plan for unexpected events and to decrease cost of long-term borrowing, which you've just seen in our uh, uh, bonds that we just purchased. When e Elizabethtown is planning capital projects, unbudgeted costs include students moving into the district with specialized needs, unanticipated events that cause students to be homeless, which, which causes unanticipated transportation costs, spikes in healthcare, which we're currently seeing for the last three years and continue to see this year um, that we can't plan for and other unforeseen circumstances. The lack of sufficient fund balance could cause raising of taxes in the future beyond uh, what Act 1 will allow, which means you would have to go to PDE for exceptions to the Act 1, or you would have to, if you're in the middle of a capital project, you'd have to go to the voters to approve one of two things. Uh, a poor fund balance will reflect negatively on the district from the standpoint of our bond ratings. It, higher borrowing costs could be anticipated, and I'm not, I can't tell you definitely any of this. I'm telling you what could happen. Uh, potentially, there could be no premium, as we just saw with the $1.4 million premium on our last bond, or there's also a possibility of selling bonds at what they call a discount, which means that you would receive less than a dollar on the dollar of the loan. So they could pay 92 cents on a dollar. So the district would actually, in this case, would have gotten less than $15 million for the bond. Um, covers This will cover on plan cost. Uh, one of the things that I consider fund balance is an insurance policy that we're not paying premiums. Yes, it is our money. We're receiving uh, interest on it, but we're not paying premiums to cover unexpected costs. Uh, it reflects the long the financial strength. Uh, it also could be used for, we, we haven't seen it recently, but it could be used for curriculum planning long term that can we can we spend X for a curriculum program that over a three year period and we could offset it or assign fund balance to pay for it each of the three years and not have increases in the general fund in the taxes for the, from the general fund. So there's a lot of different things that you could use fund balance for over a period of time. Uh, our current fund balance has changed dramatically since our two, what I keep seeing and what the questions that reflect this are the fund balance as of our last audit, which is the only time you really know fund balance truthfully. You fund balance sort of ebbs and flows during the year based on expenses, but the true facts are when the audit is completed. Uh, we had, which were reflected last year, we assigned fund balance. Uh, we had committed fund balance, which was the construction project. And we were only between three and 4% in total uncommitted fund balance, unassigned fund balance. The state will allow every school district 8%. We are usually well under the 8% in unassigned fund balance. Next slide, please. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So what for our borrowing power, what is the percentage that they like to see for our fund balance of the budget? If you uh, looked at the uh, the report from our uh, bond council, Moody's. I haven't gotten through that yet. Okay. Completely. <laughs> it's a good reading material right before bedtime. <laughs> if you looked at the Moody's ratings, they said that we are a 20% fund balance, which they consider strong. And they sort of insinuated, and I wouldn't keep them to the exact percentages, but that if we could get it to 25%, there is a potential of reducing rates. If you go under 17%, there's the potential of increasing rates. That was the, the window that they sort of gave us in there, 17 and 25. I would not say that if you're at 16.9, it's going to go up. And I wouldn't guarantee that you're at 25, it's gonna go down, but that's somewhat of the window that they were looking at, okay? So if we're at this slide, what I wanted to do, and it, for one of the concerns I have sometimes is that the general fund balance seems to be, <laughs> sorry, the general fund balance seems to get lost as the only one that we're talking about. We have three main funds in the district that impact us. We have a general fund, a capital reserve fund, and a health fund. Capital reserve fund, Mr. Emery is very familiar with because that's facilities. That is the uh, ability to build, renovate, fix any capital asset. So if we need new heating system in a building, HVAC, that will come. That can come out of capital reserve. 
uh, any renovations. And as I've told you before, I'm very, was very strong. The $15 million was not borrowed because we needed it today. The 15 million is that you're in the middle of a feasibility study and any feasibility study of anything, any major project, whether it's a school district, whether it's a government entity, whether it's a business, for-profit business, you don't come out one day and say, you know what, next month we're going to start building a, a brand new building or we're going to redo this entire building and we have plenty of money for it. It's got to be a three to five year process. So the bond was part one of the process to build up some capital reserve to begin that process. You also, there's no way that we should be uh, unhearing to our taxpayers and uncaring. Because one of the things you don't want to do is we don't want to say, oh, we're going to build a new building or we're going to fix a building up. And next week, we're going to ask you at the next election, we're going to ask you for a 20% raise in property taxes. That's not right. So how do we slowly gain to where we need to be when you decide what you want to do? I have no idea what you want to do, but it's my job to give you the funding to do what you need to do without a major impact on taxpayers. So that's really one of the reasons that we did the 15 million is to slowly build that. That's our capital reserve fund. We're doing well in getting that to where it needs to be. It's not where it needs to be today. We'll slowly get to that. We'll get interest earnings on that. And I'll show you some numbers as we go. The other area that's a major concern is our health fund. The health fund is the exact same thing as the capital reserve fund, only for health. It's, it, is, it was created so that the district has spikes in medical costs. All of you read the newspaper, watch medical costs are rising. No matter where you are, they're rising and there can be spikes. One of us gets sick. It could be a $200,000 event or it could be a $5,000 event. None of us know today what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And those spikes, we pay the first 200,000 for every one of the people that are covered under our insurance. And I always thought, maybe it's showing my age, but a 200,000 medical event was huge. Today, a knee replacement could be $200,000. And that to me is not a huge medical event. So you start looking at it, and this is Linda Muth and I were talking back and forth in some of these, Someone that needs two knee replacements at two different times, possibly the same year, possibly in two years, is $400,000 to the district. You don't get a discount because you already had one. So, and, and that's not joking, that is the exact cost to the district because it's two separate events. So we start looking at these things as to how can we not have to hit the general fund every time we have a spike. That's what the health fund's for. Same as capital reserve, we slowly build it. It earns interest, it er has some earnings. We should be doing the same thing in the health fund. Uh, those are the three funds we need to look at, not just capital reserve. And one of the things that's currently in the capital reserve fund is $1.9 million assigned to the general fund. And you'll see as we go through this, the reason that it was assigned like that. Next slide, please. So let's get into the numbers. I've tried to go back to 17 and give you some history on the exact same items. So our general fund committed numbers, we were at a million dollars from 17 to 20. We went to 400,000, 21, 22, and we went to 8.7 million in 23. Looks to me like there was the building project was getting ready to prepare is really what happened. The assigned money in general fund, 2.3 and 17, 700, for a couple of years, 1.33759, and then 59. And that's just one to fluctuate, and it depends on what you want to assign it for. General fund unassigned, you can see how that moves across the board. We're down to 1.5 at the as of the end of or June of 23. Non-spendable fund balance. What that is, is we have accounts payable June 30th, and we have to pay them in the new year, but we committed to paying it the year before. So it's already spent but we just didn't write the check yet. We've already committed to buy something. The, not, uh, the capital reserve fund, again, we just left the general fund. We're going to capital reserve. You can see in 17, it was 15.5, and it's gone up and down over the years to 2023, 3.5. Our bonds, whenever we receive a bond, and you'll start seeing in 23, 24 audit, you'll see a new bond. The bond 19, which is what this bond was recently, 
will be disappearing this year. We'll be spending it down to zero and a bond 24 fund will take its place, which is the 16 million that we just took over. The health fund, and I put a green highlight on the end. Now this is a number that we budget and it goes up and down. Uh, this year's budget, and I'll get into a little bit more detail as we go, but you only have $173,000 in health fund that's supposed to offset spikes. And we pay the first 200,000. So I think it's a little low is my concern. Next slide, please. And uh, just to, to that, just as a note, the general fund in 23 included the sale of two schools at $2.8 million. So that's why some of it has gone up. Next slide. So since June of 23, what's happened in the district? So in our general fund, we had 16 point, almost $3 million of capital, I'm sorry, of fund balance. Our non-spendable was 157, so we do eliminate that. Our committed to construction, 8.7 million. The construction project has been approved and is underway. You can say it's fund balance, but it's spent. No matter how you look at it, we've spent that $9 million as part of the fund balance. And we moved, if you recall, back in March, we moved $2 million to capital reserve. So as of- I have a question. Sure. So in terms of this topic here, um, it's it was, it was said to me that um, there was an impression that uh, uh, when we got this bond and quote unquote paid ourselves back, mm -hmm. Um, you used the term paid ourselves back. Yep. That led to led people to believe that um, the money that we paid ourselves back with could be used for anything. Would you comment to that? Sure. Remember what I said a few minutes ago, I would not have asked you to take the step of getting $15 million in bond if you didn't have a project in the future. You'd use your cash spend your money and it's gone. It would reduce your fund balance by, by $9 million because that was the plan nine and then the $5 million bond pays the $14 million of the, fund, of the athletic project and we're done. However, you told me by a feasibility study that you do have a plan for the future and that things need to be done. Don't know what, that's your call but I need to be able to give you the financial wherewithal to be able to make that decision. And not three years from now, you say, well, I wanted to do that. Well, sorry, you don't have anything. We'd have to start over again. And I, we don't want to do that. So that $7 million pays ourselves back, but bonds means it has to go to capital reserve. It's building for a future, for a future capital project. It's not building for a, the general fund. It's a capital project build slowly so you get to where you want to go with whatever project rebuild building i don't know so those funds can't be used for anything except for a building project no they can be used for anything that's a capital reserve asset you can fix an asset you can repair an asset you can build an asset any of those areas but it has to be used for a capital project so if you told me you wanted to replace repair the HVAC or replace the HVAC in any of our buildings, that's a capital project. So yes, you could use it for that. Okay. Then it doesn't come out of the general fund, it would come out of capital reserve. So if, as we saw last year, the heaters break in a building, you wanna replace them at $200,000, that cannot come out of capital, you don't have to use general fund money for that. So, so those monies are exempt from budget? No, they're in your capital reserve for the purpose of capital projects or capital repairs so that you don't have to over budget your general fund to make up for what could happen to your I capital, your see. assets, your assets break. We have to fix them. We can do it as a capital project. Thank you. Sure. So with that, we went from 16 million to three, almost three at the beginning of the 23, 24 year. Currently we're at 5.4 million in, in the general fund. In the capital reserve area, we started at 8.6 million. We're subtracting our bond, which the $5 million bond we're spending for the athletic project. You move $2 million into the capital reserve. In the 23-24 year, the expenses budgeted 
to repair capital was 649,000. Interest paid to the capital reserve account through April was $93,000. So it currently is at, as of the end of April, was at $5 million. Because I'm not hiding anything, but to do this was before we received the proceeds in our bank account. And I absolutely will not report to you anything that I don't have in my bank account. So we currently now have $16 million in our bond fund that it will change that, but it will not, it'll go in capital reserve slash bond 24. So it won't show as capital reserve. It'll be in bond, but it'll be part of the capital reserve account. Does that make sense? Okay. Mr. Next. Strickler. Yes. Um, just so that we can make sure that we're looking at this correctly. So on the general fund, you have the committed to the construction project 8.7. We are looking to transfer seven of that to cap reserve, correct? Correct. So when we're looking at this, that 5 million is going to go up to 12 million. Well, technically that's what I, just saying that technically that's why I used the whole 14 million or I'm sorry, 16 million. If you'd add that right now, today, your bond, your capital reserve went up the entire 16 million. You'll spend 9 million of it for your athletic project and you're moving a total of nine over. So that will basically the capital reserve will still have your $9 million that you had in general fund. We're moving seven this year to next year. I can't okay. show it though till you actually do it. That's why this is the actual fund now, I'm not hiding it. You will be moving seven this year. I will ask you to move to next year, which is what the commitment was when we got the bonds. But two of, but that seven is coming from that 8.7 that is currently Correct. on here. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the funds are there. Correct. It's just, a, there's like an in-between section where the funds are kind of, in limbo where it's going because we had not received the 16 million yet i would be lying to you if something happened in the to the proceeds between when we were supposed to get them and today so correct. we did this slide we did not have the 16 so you're correct there will be it will be there it came in two days ago so we're good but the 16 is separate from the 8.7 8.7 is what we currently have in the general fund that is part of the committed construction, right? Correct, but it will go to cap reserve. Correct. The 16 will be reduced by the nine instead of the eight. You follow that? Yes. Correct. So I just want to make sure that the way it appears on here, it's as if the 8.7 is gone. When you put that subtraction on there, it looks as if it's gone. Where did it go? That is going to the capital reserve, which will increase that capital reserve. As of today, with the new money in, you have twelve million nineteen thousand three hundred ninety-five dollars in the capital reserve. And that's before we transfer that's the seven. Assuming you're going to transfer the seven, because the five and the seven are twelve million nineteen. Your bond. And then we have the bond, the sixteen in the bond. Correct. Okay. Thank Does that you. Make sense. And to go along with that, the seven million that we are going to move over is it's listed in the general fund, but it's committed to capital funds. And that was part of the bond purchase that we said we were going to move that over. So that's not money that we can hold back in the general fund at this point. Basically, in their in our bond sales agreement, it said the bond resolution stated that we are using it for a capital project. You can't tell the IRS that we're borrowing money for a capital project to pay ourselves back, but then we're going to keep the $7 million in the capital reserve account to use it for general spending. That's against IRS rules. Again, remember, the whole point of this was to build a capital reserve to do something in the future. Okay. Next slide is the health fund. And I'm going to be very honest to you as your financial person. This one bothers me. And I'm being very upfront, uh, 24, 25 budget. <clears throat> we, if you recall, we were playing with this and we joined a consortium, which will not have any impact on this year. It'll be future. That was the reason to try to level costs. We just completed our open enrollment with our staff. So our open, we know about what the budget was, what our assured partners have told us, what we should budget based on singles and based on families. 
So in front of you, I put the numbers that we're seeing based on the open enrollment numbers in the district. Remember the IRS requires us to increase the HSA to all uh, participants. So every single member gets an additional $800 this year and every family gets an additional $200. So with that, we have an increase of $62,000 uh, in costs. Our medical rate for singles is $893 and our family rate is $2273, which you see becomes $8,075,000. So a total of $8.1 million is going to be our cost, is our, is our expected cost for 24-25. We budgeted $7.4 million. So we're about $680,000 short. That is in the budget that you're to approve tonight. We are already six eighty four dollars short in the health fund. 23-24, I went back to try to get a, a closer update because we, again, you sort of play with this as you go. As of April 30th, uh, we are, our cost is 6.775,000. We budgeted 6.651. We're over budget through 10 months of $124,000. So between being $680,000 short next year and 124,000 in 10 months over, we've got a problem in our health funds. So it's all has to, because there's only 175,000 in the fund to start with, it's all gotta come out of general fund. So that's where I am extremely worried about going into next year without uh, strengthening our health fund. And I told you at the beginning, we have 1.9 million in the general fund assigned to the health fund because we saw the spikes coming. And uh, I will probably be asking you at some point this month to move some of that assigned fund balance to the health fund just to cover this year's expenses. Next slide, any questions on health? Yeah. Um, where do you think that health fund should be at year to year, like uh, to, to provide that cushion? I mean, it looks like we'll barely make in the mark. And if we get blindsided, you know, or uh, is it just going to come out of general fund and we'll just uh, increase taxes at that time? Or should we putting money to the side to cover for when it, really goes downhill. I'm going to put you and Mr. Gillis in the same room. Thanks for leading me. Next slide. <laughs> so fund balance review. Basically, I just presented it a different way. It's the actual numbers going across, comes out to the same thing. As Mrs. Linda Moose said, some of the things is that 16 million. The very bottom, uh, Mr. Riggleman, the health fund estimate based on 10 month experience. Health fund balance, in my opinion, and working with asking many colleagues should be about four to six months of your budgeted expense. So this year we should, for 24, 25, we should be looking at somewhere between 2.7 and $6 million in the fund at the beginning of the year. Because then I could come to you and say, we're gonna spike this year, but why don't we let 10, 90% of the spike be eaten by some of the interest that's been earned over the years and all of that and only add 10% to general fund. So we could sort of level those taxes if we'd have to have any, but right now the health fund isn't even, um, if you look at it, and I don't mean 170,000 is a lot to my pocketbook and same as yours, but I don't mean to belittle that, that much money, but when we're talking an $8 million cost, we should have money in there to earn its own interest because now the general funds are earning all the interest, but it's not helping to slow down costs to the taxpayers each year. So every year, if we continue with this hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar balance in health fund, we're going to be saying, I have to put the full cost of next year's estimate in the budget. If we could slowly say, you know what? Hopefully joining the consortium is gonna slow down those spikes, but maybe a year we don't have to move anything to the general fund budget. We can just take the same as we took last year which would mean a no cost increase just for healthcare. And I, I can't tell you that because we haven't gotten to that point, but at 5% interest if we had $4 million and we'd be earning some decent interest earnings during the year. Does that help? Okay. So this, the range that you give us here is a difference of like almost 3.5 million. Why is that range so extreme? It's what, what I'm saying is it's, 
you should have somewhere between your four and six months. So we're estimating that our cost could be, you know, I say $6 million. That would mean that we potentially would be able to not to, I could come to you if you had 6 million at the end of the year going into next year. I'm thinking of interest earnings and all that. So if we had three and start, four and start, maybe it was a level year, get up to six at the end of the year, we may not have to do any cost increase in the general fund for next year, but yet our assured partners told us it was going to be a 4% cost increase in medical. We don't have to do anything in the general fund because we've got enough, enough in healthcare to cover the normal cost as we've covered the last year. So I hate to use this word because you're going to take it the wrong way, but it would almost be for healthcare only a 0% tax increase for your healthcare. So now all you would have to look, and you're looking at an $80 million budget, 10% of that is our healthcare and it's not going to go down. So how can we level that off a little bit so the general fund's not having to absorb huge increases every year? That's really what, no different than capital reserve. You come to me, want a big amount of money for capital, we have to slowly build it. Same thing with healthcare. We gotta slowly build it so we can stop the spikes in the general fund going to health fund. Next slide. Final is the, on the fund balance is the current general fund balance. Uh, I gave you all of this. And uh, just to answer another question that came, I only put this slide on for the blue note at the bottom. This information anticipates not moving the $600,000 that you, the board had discussed back in March for the capital reserve. We said 2.6, move two now, six later. My feeling is that the $15 million, we covered the beginning of a strong fund balance for capital reserve. Let's keep the 600 where it is as fund balance to use for uh, next year. And then, of course, I didn't have time to redo the slides because let's, Mrs. Linda Muth and I didn't have time to talk, but I have to throw this in because I am somewhat irritated today. And as most of you board members saw in the email, uh, yeah, I was not a happy person. Uh, effective at noon today, we received notice from PDE that we will not be receiving our full 100% transportation subsidy for the 23-24 school year. Because they are over budget by $100 million, because they forgot the budget enough for transportation subsidies for all 500 school districts. So therefore, they're gonna put the difference into the 24-25 budget. And it's E-Town along with 499 other school districts will have to wait for our full allotment until the 24-25 budget is approved. So therefore, we will not see it in the 23-24 year. My guess is, just unless one of you can tell me differently, uh, we cut off the 23, we cut off the fiscal year on August 30th. So any bill that we haven't received, any revenue we haven't received goes into the following year. My, if I was a betting person, I would say we're probably not gonna see a budget approved by August 30th. So we will not have it for this year. Fund balance will have to cover the transportation subsidy that the state is not giving us. And as I sort of ran into all of you, that also means we lose interest at 5% that we will not get on that transportation subsidy. Well, it's not millions and millions of dollars. It's something that we were owed and we budgeted for. And it hurts. There's something that's not, we're not gonna have it to start the new year. Um, just on that note, um, as soon as Mr. Strickler let us know about that, um, I did contact our elected officials. Um, I've heard back from Representative Jones and he is already researching this and trying to see what can be done. Um, he will be talking to um, appropriations tomorrow, but it is something that we don't take lightly. The fact that the state is reneging on what they have committed to us. We have too many unfunded mandates as it is. This is one of the areas that they help to fund us and their error is costing us and costing our district dearly. And that can't go unaddressed. And so I have already put in an email to um, Senator uh, Amit. And um, like I said, I've already contacted and been contacted back by Representative Jones. So I would encourage everyone to be reaching out to our elected officials. Don't just stick with the ones that are our direct representatives, but to make sure that we are contacting them um, across the board. 
because this really can't stick. We need to be funded. Um, if they've made that obligation, I'm sure that they can find somewhere to take that from. Thank what you. is that? What does that number look like for transportation? We budgeted nine hundred twenty thousand dollars for the twenty three twenty four school year. We've received about five hundred or four hundred and forty thousand, and they're saying they think we're going to get thirty eight percent of what we're owed. Anytime I don't get an exact number, I don't know what the budget. So at this point, we're short five hundred thousand dollars. I I won't sit here and say you're, we're going to get 38% of it. But there's a uh, Zoom meeting tomorrow with all school districts, so I might be able to tell you more. But I'm at this point saying I won't commit till I see a check is Thank really you. where we are. Okay. One thing I just noticed on my thing, the one as I was going through this, and I'll show my age here, one of the things that I personally uh, look at fund balance as if you remember, and you know, some of you are too young to remember, but we used to have the Christmas clubs and the vacation clubs that we paid a little bit each paycheck so that when we wanted to go on vacation or buy gifts at the end of the year, we didn't impact our regular household budget. We could go to the bank and pick up that. That's what I associate fund balance with, that it's still my money because it's, I put it there but I can use it for something other than household expenses. So that's the health fund. That's assigned ge general fund fund balance that we assign. The board commits one of those, but it's there as sort of a stop gap for things that we need, but really don't have budgeted in the general fund. Final thing that was asked, let, next slide, is Recently, uh, E-Town School District sold bonds and received a premium on the bonds due to a positive fund balance on financial condition. Can we use the premium received to reduce property tax increase? Bond proceeds, as you all got, received the uh, folder. Uh, Mr. Riggleman, Ms. Wilson, you received it tonight. It says in the front of it, which includes face value, premiums earned and all interest earned until, pro until proceeds are expended must be used as described in the bond sale. The district plans to pay interest and principal from this account and not use the general fund for any debt service payment. Next slide. So the actual on the front of the bond sale, the blue is what is actually printed. Proceeds of the bonds are to be applied for the purpose of providing funds for and toward various capital projects of the school district, including renovations, upgrades, and addition to school district athletic facilities and education buildings, acquisition of land and other capital projects as determined by the school board. And paying costs and expenses of issuing the bonds. So we were, we've already paid all the expenses that were the cost expense of issuing the bonds. We will make both debt service payments for the 24, 25 year. There is nothing in the general fund budget to pay for anything of the 24 bonds. Final slide is questions. Yeah, Tom, I got one. Just, uh, just general overall. Yep. Um, with our given, you know, our fund balances, everything else, uh, understand that a 3.75% tax increase will bring in about $1.6 million above uh, our, our previous revenue. What happens, what do we have to do as a district if we don't get that $1.6 million given our current fund balance. Can we make up for that $1.6 million out of the current fund balance? Hold on a second. Let me get to a different slide. I was going back to the original and you already gave me those numbers. You want something else. Um, can we do it? Yes. Would I advise you to do it? No. Uh, there's a whole difference of can we do it? I mean, if you want if you as a board want, you can spend fund balance down to zero. As your financial advisor, I absolutely would not. I mean, here's a 400,000 of state revenue that everybody would have said I'm going to get and didn't. I need 400,000 in fund balance just to cover that this year because we use that as expenses when we paid for busing and fuel and all of that because that's supposed to somewhat balance out. Uh, is there a number that you should be at at fund balance? 17 to 25%, if that's if you're looking at your Moody's rating, if you're going to 
borrow money in the future. And just as a precaution that the Moody's person told me, don't play the, don't even think of playing a game because we watch, they get a report. We have to do what's called an Emma report every February. The Emma report is where we stand financially. It takes our audit report. It takes all of that information and sends it out to all of our current investors, which Moody's is one and Moody's looks at it and says, you can't like when they looked at us this year, having 20% of fund balance, 20% fund balance sitting there, they looked at our history and we've been somewhat consistent. We can't go from, hey, we're going to spend all the fund balance down to 5%. And then two years from now, three years from now, you want to build a building, we're going to get it up to 20% and hope the, rate, the, the interest rates are low. They look at the entire five to 10 year period as to how you're managing. So I really answer your question. You have the whole amount that you could spend as your financial person. I would stay as strong as you possibly can. The 20%, I would say, is a, a good, strong number. Uh, remember, that total does include total fund balance. That's capital reserve. That's right. general fund. That's the whole thing. So that's it's right. not like me saying, don't look at your capital. You look at the total. Uh, I would strongly suggest, if anything in the fund balance, that I would move some of the 1.9 that's been assigned prior to this year to the health fund because I would think all of you would feel the same that if you only had $17 in your savings account, you'd want something moved so that you could get it up at least to cover some of your expenses. You know, even a change of oil in your car is more than what $17. So I can't tell you where you should go. I'm going to follow the direction of the board, but my recommendation to the board is to look, give me some direction. I mean, both of us are in the same situation right now. This is a new board. This is a new finance person, new superintendent. We did what you asked us to do. If you tell me now that I want you to plan X during the year for next year and see where we can cut, see what we can do with, not cut, but see if we could shave here, shave there to get here. I Give me 12 months to do that. To tell me today that we want to cut X, I can do anything you tell me to do. But my, uh, I, my advice to you is to continue on the course that you're going with some overall direction in August. Can we do this? And keep us informed on a regular basis. Uh, I've talked to the finance committee. We've gotten a few uh, outside assistance and some financial reports that I can sort of, CSI use perfect. It gives me all the accounting things that I need. I can't give you as good of bar graphs and some things. I can give you more information beginning in August same dollars, same everything, but it gives you some more insight as to where the district's going and some trends. Does that answer your question? Sure. Do we have any other questions? Mr. Strickler, I don't, I'm kind of pulling this out of nowhere. It just kind of occurred to me, so I don't know if you'll know this, but do you know how many years in a row we've raised taxes? I, I know there was a zero, but I can't tell you when. It was somewhere 16, 17, and then there was four and a half, fours, uh, but I don't have that right off the top of my head. I think uh, the zero had something to do with the um, reassessment. Hold on a second. I can tell you. Just haven't had the slide. Uh, 13, 14, you were at zero. And since then, 2.6, 4, 4.1, 4.75, 3.2, 2.9, 2.75, 2.9, 3.3, .3, and this year's proposed 3.75. Thank you. Sure. And I just had one more question, too. I remember during the bond presentation, you had mentioned that um, our lenders will um, receive reports from us about our money to keep the bond in good standing. Um, and I think it was monthly reports. Is that correct? And... No, it's the Emma report annual. Okay. And there's nothing they can do to this one. But again, if this is all you're going to do, the athletic project, we're good to go. If you tell me, and I think based, I'm just assuming based on a feasibility study, you wouldn't be doing it and going through the hours that you're putting in if you're not looking at other projects. That's when the the other foot drops per se. 
that if we don't continue following the strong financial practices that we do are doing now, that's when they could come out and say, you know what, 10% fund balance, we don't, we don't, we as an investor don't feel that you're prepared to cover an unexpected event. So yeah, we'll lend to you, but it might be at 6%. It might be at 7%. I, I don't take that for gospel, but that's really what Moody's told us. We want to see 17 to 25 to maintain the rating that you have. Just a question about uh, real estate taxes. They, they are typically go out in July, correct? And then we start receiving revenue from real estate taxes when? What July time of year? 1st, the bills are received in hand. So we must send them out. There's no must. We send them out the last week of June to be received July 1st. The mortgage companies, if they receive them then, by electronic, they start paying us the end of July. We get our biggest chunks of money to the end of July and the end of August. Missing the, that July 1st date could mean that our first big chunk of money is not received until August. So we'll go, we won't, again, I keep looking at the 5% interest, our interest earnings. That's, that's to me is free money. I put it in a bank and they give me extra money. So if we don't want to miss the July 1st date for the bills to be in hand by both the individuals and the mortgage companies, because that's probably 70% of our, in, our revenue is from mortgage companies, not individuals. So roughly 70% of our revenue is going to be here by the end of the summer. Roughly 70% of our income, our revenue you're saying is pretty much going to be here by the end of the summer. By September 1st, yes. Yes. And so... By the, uh, the discount rate. So then when it comes to Harrisburg, how long does it take for the state's funds to start funneling down to us after they actually approve a budget? Is that a month later or two months later? Or when do we start seeing state revenue? It depends on when they approve it, what cycle right. we're in. So if they approve it soon enough, we'll get the first first round on time. So I would say if they approve it July, August, we'll be okay. I mean, from this, we're always okay because we have some fund balance and other things to fall back on. Uh, but if it goes into like December, really threw things off when they approved part of the budget in July, August last year, and then they held the rest of the budget until December. So that throws some grant money coming into us that messed up the PCCD funds where we normally get the annual grants. It actually became an 18 month grant this year. So we really didn't get, uh, you know, Mr. Schwartzman did his best to get a grant. He got the grant, but we're not allowed to spend it till after July 1st. So we got it during 23, 24, but we can't spend it till 24, 25. So that's the differences of the grant money really would have more impact unless the budget goes unapproved past the first payment date. That's when those with low fund balances and not much coming, not a high percent coming in, that's when they go for to banks for loans and start looking at loans. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Actually, I just have a comment. <laughs> um, Mr. Strickler, thank you so much for all the work you've put into this because again, being a new board member, <laughs> it's definitely a lot to take in and, and look over. And I, I guess I'm a little torn because I am, concerned about people wanting to move into the district if we continue to increase taxes and increase taxes and we want to bring new families in. Um, but yet I see in just the last two days, you know, the challenges of, of new things, just like, you know, what happened just today with the email you got um, and the transportation. So, yeah, I mean, I just want to throw that out there. It is definitely um, a challenging decision, you know, just because of wanting to, you know, you, we hear from people that it is hard and with the economy the way, the way it is, um, I, I feel like when I look at the difference between three and 3.75, we're only looking at $325,000. And um, I feel like, can we just find that, you know, I just, yeah, that's where I'm at. All right. 
Well, I think with that, we are ready to move on to the next um, presentation. And that is the 2425 annual tax levy resolution. And Mr. Strickler, you are up again. I love June. Bas basically all the, this is, is the tax levy that uh, budget approval this evening will require us to levy the taxes as listed, the utility tax, the interim real estate tax, what the amount is that we're charging for that, the uh, transfer taxes, as well as the earned income tax percentages. So that would go along with the current budget that's up for approval. Any questions on that? All right. So the next one is the resolution establishing homestead and farmstead exclusion. Uh, for 2425, Mr. Strickler, you're there again. I went over this at the uh, when we did th at the last meeting, the uh, increase in the amount the state's given us. We've increased about $200,000, uh, which all of us think is wonderful, which it is. However, when you look at the total number of properties of 6,800 and do the division, it really doesn't come up with a huge difference, but everybody will get more money taking off of their taxes for Harmstead, Homestead Farmstead than what they did last year. All right. Any questions on that? Very good. Um, the next one is the exonerations. Um, and this is basically, let me make sure I'm, yeah, on the right thing. Um, there are different reasons why um, people would seek to have their taxes exonerated, um, property sold or mobile home removed, um, disabled veterans, just several different reasons on here. Um, we do have quite a few different um, amounts on here. So are there any questions about this particular document? It's something that we do get every year. All right, if there's no questions, we'll move on to donations. Um, we have two donations that we'll be voting on next time. The first one, um, we received $1,000 um, in giant gift cards to be used to support the summer meals for students from the giant companies. We're very thankful for that. Um, and the second one is a donation from Common Sense in support of the facility dogs in the amount of 1,443.48. So we'll be voting to approve those at the next meeting. Are there any questions? All right. On to the next one. Um, that is state and federal grants. At the next meeting, we're going to be putting um, forth a motion to approve the administration to continue to seek state and federal grants after the budget is approved. So as we've heard, there are times where we can continue to seek grants and that helps to offset the costs that we have, which just helps us in the long run. So um, any questions about that resolution for the next meeting? Yes. If I could make one comment for new board members. Once a budget is approved, we cannot change the revenue on the budget. That is not legal. You are approving the budget revenue as stands. The law re allows the revenue budget to be changed for any grants received from state or federal government as long as the district uses it for the purpose of the grant. What, we're, what you have to approve is for us to continue going after those grants. By approving this, you are telling me that I, if we get it, I can put it into the budget. So that's really the reason that this has, it's not just a fluff, it's that we can't put any revenue into the budget unless the board approves it by state and federal. I can't go out and find new local revenue next next week once you approve a budget, but state, federal, we can as long as you approve us to keep going. That's the reason for the, the motion. All right, any questions? Thanks for that clarification. Um, the next one is the authorization to pay bills and conduct business. Um, and I did have some um, comments about that that came to me. Um, the concern was the phrasing in there. So currently it says the um, a motion for the board to authorize the administration to hire personnel, pay bills when necessary, and award, award bids within budget constraints contingent upon formal approval in the, at the August board meeting. Um, 
And there was concern about the award bids within budget constraints. And so it was suggested that we change that to the board authorizes the administration to hire personnel and pay bills as necessary, contingent upon formal approval at the August board meeting. What that allows for us to do is to say to the administration, we understand we're not here in July. We're not going to be here to approve things. You go ahead and move on with business as usual. It does not um, allow the bids to be awarded. That would be something that the board would prefer to be able to review before it would be awarded. Does that make sense? Comments, questions? So are we, um, is there a consensus that we would like to have that wording changed for the next meeting um, and the that we would take out the awards bids within budget constraints? Agreed. Agreed. That passes. Yep, I'm in favor. Very good. All right, the next one is the crossing guard contract discussion. Um, I did see in there that we did have the updated um, information on that contract with the Elizabethtown Borough that should they not have somebody available that they would be contacting the school district as well as the chief of police so that we can make sure that our, um, our crossing guard areas are covered. Does that I, I want your opinion. Does that make you guys feel comfortable with continuing with this particular contract as the administration? The only thing I'll point out, finance, is a 6.5% increase. Just saying. Keep you informed. It's a 6.5% increase over what we're currently paying. So as the board, you're you're telling me an increase in the budget. Okay. Are we comfortable with this or are we looking to say that we want to look at something different? This is our time to do that. Um, are, have we smoothed out our difficulties with the borough? Is that what I'm understanding? Because we were at, we were at a, an impasse with them where they were not, they wanted a, uh, study done or Mr. something. Mr. Strickler and Mr. Schwarzman both, I think you talked with the borough, right? Do you want to provide an update? I don't want to be the messenger through your meeting. <laughs> uh, it, the borough council is still at the same position. They want us to do the engineering study on, for High Street before they would approve uh, us taking over the crossing guard and or traffic control on High Street. So based on the fact that what I heard from the consensus from the board is we're not going to pay unless you're changing that you didn't want to pay for an engineering study for traffic study for high street. I went back, Mr. Schwarzman and I went back to uh, the borough manager and said, let's just continue the contract that we're having based. We seem to be at impasse. We're not paying for the traffic study. The borough says they're not changing anything until we pay for the traffic study. So we're an impasse. We're both in agreement with a crossing guard contract. So that's why we came back to you with a new contract. What would be the difference between the amount of the um, study and the amount of the increase that they're charging us? I cannot tell you that because I did not pursue cost when I heard the consensus of the board that you didn't want to pay for a traffic study. If you would like me to check that, I can be more than happy to. I did put in the request to Crabtree to see if that's something that could be included as part of the feasibility study, but I did not hear back from them yet as of today. I mean, that was a little while ago, but I can follow up with them again. Thoughts or questions on this? So I'm still a little confused. This ACMS, is this a new company that we're contracting with? Is this part of the old agreement? What? What's the what's changing here? So the ACMS is the company that the borough contracts with, and we pay half of that. Um, we are not obligated to pay half of that. That is something that our district has done um, because we feel that it helps to better um, set, uh, to share the burden, the tax burden, instead of making the borough constituents the only ones that have that tax burden since it is something that all of our um 
children use this. So that's why the district pays half of that. However, um, this is a company that the borough has chosen. It is not the company that the district has chosen. So what's the alternative if we vote this down? Do we have time to find another uh, crossing guard company, so to speak, by September? There really is no option because we, by state law, the borough has to provide it. We can't, the district cannot do anything. The district, the board has asked borough council for permission for them not to do it and for us to do it. Borough council come back and said, do a traffic study and we might give you that power. So the, the borough acts, council would actually have to say, we no longer want to do high, East High Street. We're giving the power to the school district to do crossing guards, traffic, whatever. They're saying the traffic study. So we're sort of at an impasse. Uh, while I said the 6.9%, until we until we do a traffic study, you're gonna be well beyond start of school. So your best bet for this year because they are changing some of the communications would be to go ahead and approve it, but maybe with direction to the administration to come back to you in the next th two to three months with what's the traffic study going to cost and what's the timing. And then we go into it from there. Additionally, there really are not an abundance of crossing guard vendors out there. So our choices are limited. Um, probably the next course of action would be engaging in some sort of a traffic study, but um, to find another crossing guard vendor, the, our choices are very limited. And you said this would be an increase of approximately how much, Mr. Strickland? Six percent, six and a half. Okay, thank you. The document that we had looked at before um, didn't have the updated rates. Is that correct? I feel like that was a, so we, this is, this was all new that we're getting this pricing. This is hot off the press. They, as fast as the borough manager gave it to me, it went on to the board agenda. And I know you said 6%. What is that dollar figure? You should know I'm going to ask dollars and not percentages. We we do. You won't vote on this till the 25th. So we could send questions to Mr. Strickler. He'll put them together. We'll get it in the board log for you just because I think he's earned his paycheck tonight. And uh, I don't want to make him quote numbers that he doesn't have off the top of his head. <laughs> I can absolutely. So if you have questions, board members, you can send them to Mrs. Lindemuth and she can get them to Mr. Strickler and we'll get them in the board log so that you have it before you need to vote on it. <laughs> so any other questions other than having Mr. Strickler give us specific numbers? It wasn't a specific number. I'm just, I'm assuming the borough would have the information if a traffic study has been done there previously, but I don't know if that's something we would have to look up. I'm sorry. I'm kind of talking to you. <laughs> I don't know if that's something we would have to look up or if we'd have to ask them if one has been, been done previously. It has not. It has I, not. No, I checked with the borough manager because that was the first thing that would, let's make this easy. Has there been one done in the right. last five to 10 years? Going back any further than 10 years would just not be a good traffic right. study. And right. she has nothing in their files that the one was done. Thank you. Yep. All right. If there's nothing else, then we'll move on to the next item, which is um, the substitute teacher service rates. Um, has everybody had the opportunity to review those rates? Are there any questions on those comments? Um, yeah, everything has gone up. From so the I'm going to understand that this 170 per day for substitute teachers What's the district near the top of Lancaster County? Is that what was presented in terms of what we're offering daily subs? The, the 170 per day, is that putting us towards the top of the pyramid in terms of Lancaster County, in terms of substitute pay? We're, we're doing this to try to be more attractive to attract subs, right? It does put us toward the top, not at the top, but much closer to the top than our current 130. Okay. And just as a, again, I'll go back to the budget. Uh, we are currently paying some, this past year, we were paying some substitutes that were being paid by the district $330 per day plus benefits. So while this seems high, this is actually a cost savings to the district by going this direction. 
if that's the case, then why am I looking at a markup line item at 34%, 25% uh, and so on? We're moving our substitutes as we discussed in budget meetings and the board approved is we're moving our substitutes to substitute teacher services. So we are paying STS a flat amount. There is no PEASERS, there is no uh, FICA and there's no benefits. So STS provides all of that as well as workman's comp. Is that the reason there's there's such a high markup because they're not getting those other benefits? It's, well, the taxes are all being paid by STS, the FICA taxes. So that's part of the markup is they're covering their, their costs. This is also an increase to make us more attractive to um, substitute teachers. We've heard for years that substitute teachers are something hard to um, attract. So when we're at the, the higher end of the food chain, so to speak, um, we will be a more attractive commodities, which means that we would have potentially better quality subs coming to us um, and less issues of not having those positions filled. That would be the goal. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, Dr. Nell, I don't know if you're able to tell us, but is this an increase for those teachers that are switching over? Because I would like to see them. I know that might be a tough switch for them to move over to STS. Will they will it be comparable to what they were getting through the district or more? I don't know that number specifically off the top of my head either. So that's something that we can get for you. Uh, we have been in communication with all of the individuals that that would impact. And we've been helping to support them through that transition because we would be happy to keep them as you know affiliated with E-Town. Um, but I'll have to get that information for you. Yeah, sorry. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, um, so the last thing that we have under finance committee is the transfer from general funds to cap reserve um, for the bond 24. We will be um, putting a motion forward to transfer the $7 million from the general fund to the capital reserve. Um, and this was what we had agreed to do as part of the bond resolution. Um, we're doing 7 million this year and 2 million next year so that we can honor our commitment of the 9 million, which is what afforded us to be able to get that bond. Any questions or comments on that? All right, with that, I am done. All right, thank you, uh, Mrs. Lindemuth and finance personnel. We will move on now to uh, policy committee items. And we have uh, three items there under the agenda. So we'll yield our time to Mr. Gillis. All right, there we go. Uh, so I have here three policies that are up for first reading for, uh, for the month of June. Those policies are 222, 323, and 823. Uh, these uh, policy 222 and 323 are initiated by PSBA. They pertain to tobacco and vaping products. Both uh, 222 is for students, 323 is for faculty. Uh, the changes to those policies basically incorporate definition of electronic devices including uh, tobacco and vaping products. And uh, that's basically it for those two policies. Uh, the third policy is policy 823. It's in naloxone. Uh, that policy is uh, requested review initiated by our district. Uh, it has to do with including in this policy uh, primary elementary uh, use of naloxone. So we have to be able to provide that for our younger students also. Um, that's the only change to that policy. So without that, uh, I recommend these three policies go through for, uh, uh, for first review. Uh, and we'll vote on that next, next time, next meeting. The uh, second reading policies for review are policy 006, policy uh, 830.1 uh, and policy 903. Uh, there's no changes at all to policies 006 and 
no uh, request for change. I do have two issues to talk about on policy 903. Policy 903 is the uh, public comment section or uh, policy. Uh, we did have a discussion the last time about expanding the authority section of policy 903 to include uh, employees of the school district. So we did that is changes made, it's in red, it's there. Uh, no issues going further on that on that subject. I did get a second uh, comment on uh, policy 903. Uh, there was an there uh, seems an inconsistency uh, in the uh, public comment section of the of the policy. Uh, first sentence uh, talks about individuals shall wait to be recognized by the presiding officer before commenting, and I must direct all comments to the board. The fourth sentence, on the other hand, says all statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. So just to be, just to clarify this, and I agree with the person who made the comments that I think we should make this, uh, the uh, comments should be directed to the presiding officer instead of to the board. Okay, so I, I concur with that. And then with our permission going forward, I'll make those changes, have those changes made to the policy and they'll be up for uh, review the next time we, we uh, next meeting. Other than that, there's no other comments on this policy. Any questions? Okay. Uh, where, that, where was that again, Mr. Gillis? You The, the uh, change? Yeah, directing rather than from the board it's on page two it's under public comments okay so is there a consensus from the board to adjust that wording the way that mr gillis suggested because we would do the same thing change the font to red let you see it before you vote on it yeah okay i'm seeing enough heads shaking okay yeah. thank you All right, with that, I recommend that those three policies also go through uh, for uh, second reading, and we will vote on them uh, next meeting. And then the final piece that I have is uh, we had a discussion also on the use of cell phones. Uh, with that, Mr. Portzer put out a, uh, a very provoking, thought-provoking uh, thought exchange to uh, three different groups. I think we have the results of that in our board log. I hope everybody had a, has had a chance to look at that. Uh, I'll make a suggestion that we, we at least open this up for review and comment uh, on this thought exchange and to where we want to go with the policy based on these comments that were given to us. Um, having reviewed them, I thought it was overwhelming that um, our faculty and staff and parents were in agreement that this is definitely an issue and it is an issue that we need to address. Um, I appreciate everybody that participated in the thought exchange because it was vital for us to hear from the people that were that will be affected by this. Um, and I absolutely believe that we need to proceed with beginning that process of finding a way to do this. I would love to see that implemented as soon as possible. Um, the evidences are there that it's wanted. The evidences are there that it is a detriment to our students' um, learning. It is a detriment to their um, social emotional aspect of it. So I see it as a win all the way around for us to begin this process and get it moving forward and in place as soon as possible. Yeah, I agree. And with that too, I think I think moving forward on this, there's uh, I think two two major options that we can do. Uh, it's, it comes down to either restrict or uh, ban cell phones completely. That's I think our two options. Uh, that's the kind of discussion I'd like to have if we could mm -hmm. as to which one, which way we kind of go on this. Could you explain the difference between the two? Well, I think right now we have a policy. We have a policy in, with electronic devices uh, that does restrict their use to some extent in, during class class times. 
they are able to use uh, cell phones, lunchtime, in the hallways, at recess, that kind of thing, and homeroom. But uh, it, I, I'm not sure that it really goes far enough, all right, based on what I'm hearing on the thought exchange. There are some other things we can probably do with that. Um, and then the other option, I think, is just, you know, ban them completely. I know there's some, uh, Tina, if you just kind of add to this with uh, Senator Allment and what's going on f with him. Yeah, this was actually going to be um, something I talked about, but I can I can just do it right now, actually, because um, Senator Allment brought uh, two different proposals to the table. One is um, saying cell phones are a distraction and a potential source of decline in student mental health and academic performance. So his legislation would create a state-funded voluntary pilot program for public schools to purchase lockable cell phone bags where students would store their cell phones during the school day. Um, schools that are part of the pilot program would track mental health, academic performance. If the plan passes, he hopes pilot schools could implement it for the 24-25 school year, which is the one coming up. Um, and his second one would is kind of um, dependent on the first one, how that goes. Um, it would actually mandate the use of lockable cell phone bags for all public high school students. Um, right now, it's at the very beginning stage. He has no idea how much um, the cell phone bags would cost or what kind of funding we would get for that. Um, but I, I think it's personally, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, I agree that there, there's something to be said for just taking it away or not using it during class. But honestly, I think it is such a prohibitive thing for our kids. Um, and I just can't get the studies out of my head that say, you know, it's a, it's a source of real worry for them too. And I feel like if we could just take that away during the school day, that would just be excellent. So I don't know it, what exactly else is out there. I've heard of these cell phone bags a few times before, um, but we could look into what other kind of things are out there as far as if we like this kind of program. Yeah, I think here too. I mean, uh, the the actual, you know, physically removing the, the device from the student is going to be cost prohibitive to every school that does this. Whether it's the purchase of bags, or we got to build lockers to put the phones in, or something, it's gonna it's gonna be expense. There's going to be an expense associated with the the banning process. I don't know if we can actually go far enough with restricting. Uh, you know, including some kind of uh, uh, punitive, uh, you know, like taking the cell phones away from a student if they're gone, if they find them out, uh, you know, and locking them up and giving them back to them at the end of the day. You know, as far as a restricting practice, I don't, I don't know if we can do that too. Something to be said for that. We've got to come up with something to put in our policy. I, I kind of think that you know, for a student that acts responsible and he doesn't pull it out to one's classroom, he doesn't use it to uh, bully other kids or transfer information or cheat on tests, that person deserved the right. It's a privilege. When they break that privilege, they ought to lose that right for the year, meaning if they're severely caught doing cheating on test, bullying on the phone, using the phone during classroom, that they ought to lose that right for the year. I mean, how more strict is that? Then that gives the, the, the pressure on the student itself, I need to be responsible. I, I don't know if that's the direction that we need to go, but I think that that's more responsible than saying to all kids, you blew it. We're taking your phones away from you. So here's uh, an interesting fact for you. Um, and it was something that popped up when I was on one of my emails um, from Verizon. We pick up our phones of an average of 350 times a day. That's an average of every three minutes. Now it didn't say children and or adults. It just said, that's the average. We have what, uh, how long is our classroom, 
Dr. Now, our classes in the high school? We have a block schedule, so about 90 minutes. Divide 90 by three, that's 30 times. I mean, that that's a lot that we are doing, where our students have that urge, that desire, that need to be picking up their phone. Um, it, it is, we, we know it's an addiction. It's, it's been documented that it's an addiction. Um, students have a harder time overcoming addictions. So I think to help our students, it would be best for us to look at removing the temptation, removing that. Yes, we want them to learn how to be responsible with it, but that responsibility for a, a device should come from the parents, not the school district. We, we should be focusing on educating our students on reading and writing and arithmetic and science and um, social studies and training them to become the best citizens that they possibly can to be able to live, learn, and thrive in a global community. They're going to get the cell phone use when they're at home. We don't have to monitor that. My opinion would be make it so that it is a ban. We do not need them in the classrooms. If a parent needs to get a hold of a student, when we were in school, the parents called the teacher. It was less distracting. If it needed to happen, they can call the school and they can get a hold of somebody. And that would eliminate the issue for so many of our teachers. And I think it would be a much better method of helping our students, our faculty, and our staff with a policy that benefits everyone. The other side of it too is is policing it. We need a policy that's able to be policed easily and not be different between each teacher or administration. Um, I know there's one option maybe that we could test that wouldn't cost any money or minimal money of having like the calculator pouches on the door where the kids drop their cell phone into the, po the pouch and they pick it up on their way out the door. So that way they have it maybe when they're going in between classes, they can check and see if they have a message from mom. But yet when they're in the classes, they put it in the calculator pouch. Um, I do like the idea of the lock pouches. I think that's an awesome way. I know that there's been schools that have done that and had really good results from that. They get to open it at lunchtime so they can sit at lunch if they want to use it or, you know, if there's an emergency or something like that. But I, I do like that, but it is going to be something that we're going to have to wait and see if we get funding for, because I think it is pretty expensive to get them. So, but we have to think of that side of it too, is policing it. Yeah. I think, I think all, all the points that have been, that are being, uh, brought up here are, are legitimate and valid. Um, but we've got two different spectrums here. I'm, I'm hearing two different two different avenues. Um, I'm of the opinion that it's got to be an all or nothing um, because kids are kids. I was a kid. And if if I've got my cell phone in my pocket, it's, it's coming out onto my desk. It's, you know, um, so I'm just saying if, if we're going to, if we, if we're acknowledging this is a problem, which I believe it is. And I believe we as a board are acknowledging that it's a problem. I think our community acknowledges it's a problem. I think our, especially our teachers, our faculty, our staff have, have acknowledged that this is a problem. We have a cell phone um, policy in place already. And I, I think our, I, I know that our, our faculty, our staff, and our teachers are trying to implement it. It's not being implemented. That's why it's a problem. And so we've got to, we've got to eliminate the problem. That's, that's where I'm at. We've got to eliminate the problem. And Mr. Riggleman, I did laugh when you said you blew it and I wasn't laughing at you. It just sounded funny because I'm not looking at this as a as a disciplinary thing at all, or like we're trying to take something away from kids. They may feel differently, some of them. Um, I'd be happy to look into what our options are, um, what different kinds of things schools have used, and maybe come back to you with that. And that could give us more um, of an idea what kind of stuff we're looking at. I do agree, I don't wanna make it. Um, I feel like if we just said, don't use it during class or if that was the rule, there'd be, there'd be a lot of policing that teachers would have to do and they have enough to do without having to run around and 
peek under kids' desks and see if they have cell phones out. So I don't think that would be the best option. You ban cell phones, it's going to still happen. I mean, that's, that's reality. Even though you ban them, kids are going to try to smuggle them in. They're going to try to use them anyway. What rules are we going to put in force that we're going to do that? The other, the, the, the main thing that I have a problem with is our military men and women. They need to call home. And the only time that they can call home is usually because they're on the opposite side of the world. So the times that they have to call has them that the kids are doing their lunchtime. And that creates sometimes the problem where the parents tend to call because that's the only time that they have to call and talk to their kids because they're halfway around around the world. And I would hate to see that we take that away from them. So if if we can get the setup at, that they can use their cell phones at lunchtime but lock it up during the day, um, I, I think that that's – what we need to do now if that's not an issue for any of our students that you know we don't have any of them calling at lunchtime or special permission for certain students to lock their phones up at at uh, you know the office or whatever that they can talk to their parents but we might be taking away the only time they have to talk to their parents Mr. Gillis, would it be possible for us to get a copy of um, several different cell phone policies from different um, boards that have already passed them and are um, implemented? I know you had Hempfield, but I believe that um, there's a couple other ones locally that had some that we could possibly review them or have you review them and give us the, the high level. Absolutely. I'll do that. I'll, I'll uh, start looking around at the different board policies on cell phones, electronic devices, and see how they're handled from a policy perspective. And I'll report back to the board as to what I find. Okay, thank you. No further discussion on this uh, topic then? Okay, I said, Tina, I guess you're gonna look at finding uh, some uh, viable, I guess, uh, options for uh, collecting phones yeah, and holding will, them in the classroom. That, All right. And I'll go ahead and look at policies where other boards have, uh, have uh, other, you know, policy issues that they deal with and how they do it. So um, we'll put this to bed for today, for today, then that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, just a reminder here about policy 006. I'm sorry to backtrack, but uh, we went rather quickly there. Um, and I don't know that this necessarily has to be policy change, but we are, I remember uh, back in August saying that we are going to do the pledge and the si moment of silence uh, before both meetings now, starting in August. So just wanted that noted. It's not really, I, it doesn't really show up under order of business, but it's just kind of a reminder uh, for everyone. Okay, um, so that concludes policy items. Uh, before we get to outside partnerships and public comments, uh, we have another school board item here for kind of general discussion. Uh, last month, we had our annual appointments. Uh, some of those institutions were financial, uh, some were legal and otherwise. Of course, we did uh, retain our two, uh, our typical two councils, uh, the two law firms that we had. Uh, there has been a uh, discussion and we, we have met with uh, an outside party, I guess we'd say, an outside organization that we were looking to uh, perhaps bring on a special counsel. And so um, they would be offering us advice, uh, second opinions. We, we have uh, contacted uh, ILC, the Independent Law Center, and uh, 
the basic idea would they that would be they would just be added onto our list of appoint appointees um, to be used at our discretion uh, as we would deem necessary. Um, basically, they they might offer us uh, advice on policy. They may offer us uh, a second opinion if we would seek one, uh, and they would do that uh, free of charge. Uh, there's no expense uh, for their legal counsel. So uh, just opening it up kind of here base, for some basic discussion about uh, we've had a chance to meet with them about a month ago. Um, you heard uh, their viewpoints, uh, what they believe, where they're coming from, and how they could possibly help us. So just wanted to open up some discussion about what your th thoughts were uh, spe speaking with them about a month ago and uh, what direction you might like to take. Is this something we want to pursue or or not? So I'm just opening up for comments at this point. Um, having met with them and the things that they presented, I felt that it was very fair and balanced. Um, the information that they presented, everything that they brought to us did seem to fall in line with um, things that are constitutional. I appreciated the perspective that they brought and that it was, it was not leaning in any direction, that it was very clear that they were looking to um, make sure that all of our students, faculty, and staff were represented in any policies that they did present to us. Um, I was very appreciative of the manner in which it was presented and how they um, they made sure that we are doing things above board. Um, the reality is with this being a free special counsel, we did not have to put this forward the way that we did, we chose to make sure that we had the comment time and um, that it is going to be presented and voted on. Um, and I feel that is that is showing the character of making sure that we are doing things above board. My opinion is, is very basic in nature. Um, I think information is king. I think knowledge is king. I think wisdom is king. And so if somebody's offer, offering me advice uh, or us advice uh, pro bono without spending a penny of tax, tax dollars and, and they're accessible uh, whenever, wherever, um, I say absolutely. I say absolutely. I think it's just more information for us. More information is better. Gives us a better a balanced uh, uh, process for making changes if we want to. We don't have to accept their uh, recommendations. That's up to the board, right? It's not the it's not the group that's making the decision. It's the board that actually implements the recommendations. If we choose not to, we don't. So I think it's a great idea. Well, I agree. Um, I think the, the thing that struck me the most about their presentation is just the fairness. That was their main goal is we don't want to exclude anybody. We don't want anybody to feel bad. We It's all fair across the board. And I really like that. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation going around right now um, about this group. And I would just ask that people maybe do a little more homework before assuming the worst. Um, we honestly do care about these kids. That's why we're up here. That's why we do this. So we may not all agree on anything, but we would never want to hurt any of our children by making them feel bad or excluded. My only concern is that what if we get two different opinions from two different law firms? Uh, I have read some of that, what you're talking about, Tina, about the uh, different positions they take. They take. I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I'm just concerned that what if we get two different opinions, then now we're kind of caught between two points. 
Uh, I'm just a little concerned about bringing on another law firm. That's just my concern. So I'll just voice that opinion. So to that concern, I mean, we're a board of nine. And so we have different opinions on this board on a regular basis. I, I think our voting record has shown that, especially in the last several years. But what we have to look at is having those options. If we only have one opinion and we don't see the other opinion, then we don't know that that opinion is available out there. So if we get two opposing opinions, we would have to, um, as the, the board members, look at that and say, you know, we know our district and this opinion over here, that's not going to be the best for our district. This opinion is going to be the best for our district and we need to flow with that. As long as we can show that both opinions are constitutional, then it would be our decision to then make at that point, which one is the better decision. And that's what we were elected to do. Yeah, uh, just just a comment uh, as well, Mr. Reed. Um, just and, and this isn't a pushback at all. It's it's just simply uh, we're in a position on this board uh, to be informed, um, and so if we're seeing things from all sides, uh, not just one or two, but all sides, um, we're better equipped, I think, uh, as a board uh, to make a decision in the benefit of everybody concerned because if if we've only got one side one opinion or one view well then we're only making a judgment call from that position so um i i do respect what you say in here i i, I truly do um but i am of the opinion that uh you know we need to we need to be able to see each line item each agenda item each each problem or or whatever that comes to the board, we need to be able to view it from all sides and and put many different pairs of shoes on, so to speak, in order to make a, the right decision. Um, and that's that's why I'm I'm saying more knowledge is better. And so it's it's not whether or not the information is correct or incorrect. It's simply more information. And I think that makes us stronger. I can't argue that. Um, I was just expressing a concern. I would yield to the will of the board, obviously, but I was just wanting to express a concern. That's, that's what I was doing. Any other comments as it relates to our meeting last month or just observations um, i just had a comment um i was um impressed with uh what they presented i thought that the policy they presented us with um we asked some hard questions of them of you know some of the things logistically with that policy they presented um and i felt like they gave us you know good answers to to some of the things and why they would recommend that um they um they also were were able to explain some of, I think, the negative things that have come upon them, which I thought that they did a good job explaining, you know, some of the different situations they've been in and, and telling us, you know, what they were recommending to other schools and, and why they recommended those things and, and what really came up about in some of the school districts um, that was different than what I think a lot of us had seen, you know, in the media and things like that. Um, so I think, because it's pro bono and it's a, a service that, you know, that we could add. And, and as we said, it's not something we have to agree with just because they give us a policy. We don't have to say, oh, we're gonna adopt this. We still need to debate it as a board and decide whether it is a good fit for our district. But I think it's good just to get another opinion, so. All right, well, I thought the presentation we had a month ago was, was fair. I think he was actually very gentle gently presented, uh, keeping everything in mind, a uh, very cautious approach that they really take. Um, so, you know, I think we've, we haven't rushed this through. We're taking, we, we took our time uh, considering it, putting it on the agenda, discussing it. This is not something that's 
been rushed through. Uh, this something we are we're considering here for several months. So um, seems like we have a general consensus to move forward. And uh, from what I can tell, we will have this item up for vote uh, in two weeks on the 25th. So um, that concludes concludes our discussion there. Um, we are ready to move on with, as long as everyone is okay with bathroom breaks. Let's press through. Okay. We are, huh? We are ready to, yeah, we're ready to move forward with community uh, committee reports here. Um, so I think we'll, we'll press through that and then we'll, we'll gauge where we're at. Um, are you 13, Mr. or uh, Mrs. Shrum? Thank you, Mr. Lindemuth. Our May meeting was held at the Lancaster IU Center on May 22nd. Um, we began with a work session so that we could receive strategic business units from each department within the IU 13. So the SBU includes reviews and highlights as well as each individual department giving budgets. And there are 15 total departments. Um, and numerous programs under each department. Um, so that took our work session time. Numerous bids were awarded in the area of business services as well as contracts approved that evening. Um, we also approved the second reading of policy 611, 612, and 616. Then a first reading policy was presented 625, which is purchases, cards, and store purchases cards. That was approved for second reading. Um, under the Early Childhood and Special Education Department, um, we approved uh, the following revised fiscal year. So the 23-24 budgets, there were some revisions. Um, section under Early Learners, Special Education, Classroom Services, um, Itinerant Solutions, and Federal Pass-Through Funds Administration Services. Then under instructional technology services, also some fiscal year at year 23-24 budget um, revisions were made. Those were community education, teaching and learning collaborative, student services, and regional technology solutions. Two of the human resources um, were changed or um, revised, and that was under the administrative and management services, as well as internal service for employee benefits. Um, also, under human resources, some personnel actions were approved, two retirements, 18 resignations, 24 new employees, 15 change of positions, and nine leave of absences. Under new business, um, an appointment was made for a board um, to uh, nominate officers for the next meeting. So that would be just board officers similar to what we do here with our own board. Um, also, uh, the PSBA Delegate Assembly, we needed to make an appointment, and Mrs. Rivera was appointed to be our delegate for IU 13 for that assembly. First reading of also the 24-25 IU board meeting calendar was also um, under new business. Then there were some acknowledgments made. Um, so there were multiple food items donated to Lancaster Lebanon IU 13's Learning Curve Cafe by Gus's Keystone Family Restaurant. Uh, clothing purchased at discounted rates for IU 13 school to work students by Alfred Dunner. Facility space donated for an IU school to work professional development day and that was donated by LCBC. And then also um, facility usage food and drinks donated for staff and students for the IU 13's Spring Student Bazaar. And that was donated by Cornwall Manor. And then finally, um, the IU 13 is presenting a Lancaster and Lebanon Educator Appreciation Night um, that will be actually this Friday, the 14th, at Clipper Magazine Stadium for a Barnstormers game. So all teachers can join for the special game celebrating educators from Lancaster and Lebanon school districts and the CTCs. Educators may register for two free tickets courtesy of IU 13. So you would just go on to the LancasterStormers.com to register for those. Then our next meeting will be um, held June 26th, also at the Lancaster Center. And that's the report. All right. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Trump. We'll move on to uh, Lancaster County CTC, Mr. Riggleman. 
Yeah, so I got this letter from Stuart um, stating uh, the school is barely out a week and the full steam into summer work across the institution um, <clears throat> to prepare for next year. Uh, Tim K is his team or is, is doing great stuff at Brownstown, for example, is cleaning the decades of wood dust and debris from the cabinets making program space um, because they're implementing new programs in CTC. For, uh, some programs are being uh, shortened or uh, minimum space where others are growing. Um, we are also upgrading into a manufacturing space. All of these efforts are possible because of the fiscal support from our JOC and districts. By next summer, we'll only have a few more spaces in need of refurbishing a fair cry from where we were five years ago. And I'll end it at that. All right, thank you. Lancaster County Academy, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Lindemuth. Uh, we had 283 graduates last week and we had uh, three more who graduated from LCA on June the 1st. Uh, Sierra Fox, Scarlett Einich, I think is her name, say her name, and uh, Reagan Riker. So congratulations to the three students. I was not able to attend that graduation uh, being out of town, but I believe it, it will be on the website very soon if you want to go on their website to be able to view their graduation ceremony. It's very, uh, very, um, it's a small group, uh, very um, for, informal and uh, a very enjoyable ceremony. So I would encourage you to get on that and, and check it out when it's available. So we had our last meeting back on May 29th. Uh, we did have two student withdrawals between February and May from Elizabethtown. Uh, one student request and one as a, because of a move. So that's, they wanted to report on that. We do currently have four students attending LCA for the next uh, school year. So I wanted to report on that as well. At our last meeting, we had a uh, executive session dealing with personal issue. And we also voted to approved uh, upcoming uh, LCA West um, location at Crossroads Brethren Church. So that'll be again for this coming year. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Encouraging news there. Uh, PSBA, Mrs. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Lindemuth. Um, so more stuff from our legislators, 87 page House Bill 2370 was recently introduced by Democrats to Pennsylvania legislators. This bill would increase public education funding by 1.1 billion. It also includes a 5.1 billion increase that would be compounded over the next seven years. The bill passed the House Education Committee but still needs to clear the Republican controlled Senate before it reaches Governor Shapiro. Republicans are opposed to the bill over concerns that the multi-billion dollar increases, along with the other spending of Shapiro's proposed budget, could deplete Pennsylvania's $14 billion in reserves. Republicans are also pushing for $3 billion in tax cuts. Representative Brian Cutler said that it is not fiscally sound to add unstable, I'm sorry, unsustainable recurring costs on Pennsylvania taxpayers. Pennsylvanians are already paying more and more and getting less. We believe this money comes from the taxpayers and it must be returned to the taxpayers, said Cutler. The bill's primary sponsor, Democrat Mike Sterla, says the $5.1 billion increase is needed to close the funding gap in Pennsylvania and that spreading the increase over seven years makes the bill feasible. Um, two Democratic senators, Tim Kearney and John, John Kane, have plans to introduce legislation that would establish a pilot program for school-based youth courts. These courts would replace traditional discipline for minor offenses in schools with trauma-informed peer-led peer youth courts. This legislation would provide annual grants for schools to implement youth courts, promote partnership with local law schools and bar association, and of course, collect data to measure the efficacy of the youth courts. Senator Kane said that he believes these courts would offer a second chance to some kids and would help end the school to prison pipeline. And lastly, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a new initiative to combat childhood hunger called Sunbucks. 
the sun standing for summer nutrition. Families will receive $120 for each child under the age of 18 on an electronic benefit transfer card to be used for groceries. The initiative also offers sun meals where children can visit a designated site and eat free meals and snacks. In more rural areas where group meals are not available, families can pick up free meals or have them delivered. These benefits are automatic. Families will either receive a PEBT Sun card or the $120 will be uploaded to their regular PEBT card if they have one. Benefits are expected to be available from mid-August to October, which makes you wonder why it's called Sunbucks or geared towards summer nutrition, but that's government for you. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Mrs. Wilson. Uh, last, we have uh, Ed Foundation, Mrs. Linda Booth. Yes, um, so we met last on June 5th. It was a bright and early morning right after graduation. So um, it was Dr. Nell and I were sitting there and we were trying to keep our eyes open for sure. Um, but it was a good meeting. We had um, conversations about the innovative programs um, and we refresh my, did we approve those innovative programs? Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't, it was a really late night the night before. Um, yes, we so, awarded many grants to some of our teachers. Yes, for mm -hmm. the innovative program. So um, we had many grants that were presented to us by teachers um, and we were able to award the ones that were presented to us. So that was a really neat opportunity to be able to go through that. Um, we also had a financial update um, and continuing conversations about our alumni association. We're hoping to get that up and running. And then we did have um, nominations and we had a reorganization for the um, the board. So that's pretty much all we had. Um, I'm not quite sure when we have our next meeting, but it won't be in July. That's all I know. All right, thank you to everyone for those reports. We appreciate the news. Um, I guess at this time, I want to just take a little survey here. It's, it is 8.30. Do, does anyone need a break? Would, is there any consensus? Okay, we will take a short five to seven minute break if possible and try to be back then for the rest of the meeting. So a prop, I, I'd say no later than certainly 8.40.
All right, uh, we will start our public comment time now. Just a reminder that you have five minutes. Uh, if you do not need the whole five minutes, uh, please yield your time to the next person uh, and try to keep your comments pertinent to, uh, for the most part, to agenda and non-agenda items. So with that being said, I again will read off uh, the lineup here and uh, who's kind of the on in the batter's box, so to speak. So we will start with, I believe it is, is it, is that a K, Koppel, David? David Koppel, followed by Kim Kleindienst. You want to hear me? All right, thank you. I wanted to talk about the uh, proposal to engage with the Independence Law Center. Uh, I had struggled initially to figure out a way to convey my point in a way that you, the board, would hear and maybe even listen. I wanted to both respect it, your perspective and present my own so that we could understand my concern, you would understand my concerns and hopefully respect them in turn. However, upon reading Mrs. Lindenmuth's comments in the LMP this morning, I realized that her decision at least had been made and no amount of discussion will change that. She's already characterized all controversy surrounding ILC as unfair and claims that engaging them will be free. It seems unlikely based on the history of the Lindenmuth's participation on this board that either of them will change their mind once made up or even acknowledge a mistake. Given the other comments, such as how anyone concerned should do our homework or how more information, regardless of the source, is good, it's clear that many of the board have also decided and are happily ignoring or outright dismissing the justifiable controversy that surrounds this organization. The fact that your personal beliefs align with theirs is not the same as them being neutral. Pretending the controversy doesn't exist just means you're dishonest. So I'm not here to convince the board not to engage the ILC. Instead, I'm here to warn the parents and residents of what the risks of that decision are. Mrs. Lindemuth claims that the ILC will be free. Unfortunately, I have little faith in either of their abilities to assess cost. We certainly saw their failings in that regard when Mr. Lindemuth questioned the salaries of our service dogs, or when the district enacted a revamp of the library rating system, largely at the insist their insistence, all for the benefit of less than two dozen families. The reality of engaging the services of ILC, given their reputation and agenda, I fear, is that the board may enact policies upon their advice that will be deliberately provocative, and the result will be protest, disruption, and invitation to legal action against the school district. If that happens, it will be our money as taxpayers that will have to go towards defending the board's actions. It will be our money as taxpayers that goes towards damage control. It will be the students and the faculty of the school that will have to deal with the fallout. Religious freedom is a wonderful hallmark of our country, but you must remember that it applies to all. Across the nation, we're seeing school districts pushing for more religious influence in schools. And increasingly, we're seeing groups taking action of uh, advantage of that by calling for equal protection of rather unintended consequences. There are other religions besides yours. They also qualify for religious protection. The Satanic Temple, for example, has been pushing to open after-school Satan clubs across the country. Did you know there's one in Pennsylvania? The school district where they opened it shut it down and the Satanic Temple sued them and won the right to maintain that club, as well as $200,000 in legal fees, which had to be paid by the school district. Remember though, as we heard from our board tonight, more information is good. 
Engaging the ILC could result in our children's education being disrupted, the district's budget running short again, and our taxes going up, or even literal Satanists choosing to use our district to counter one political statement with another. If anyone, any of that happens, I want everyone here to remember whose decision that was. All right, uh, Kim Kleindienst, followed by Bruce Kleindienst. Thank you. Good evening, board members. If you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. My husband says this all the time, and I never thought much about it until working with this board. Last meeting, Mrs. Lindemuth presented concerns with continuing with the Samaritan Center for free mental health screenings for E-Town students, citing the center's lack of willingness on their part to observe a parent's right to access their child's mental health information. She said our solicitor agreed to this interpretation of the law. When I asked her about the solicitor's rationale, I was told she couldn't provide that due to attorney-client privilege. If you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. I'm not an expert on HIPAA laws or solicitor rulings, but these are my understandings. Mrs. Lindemuth didn't mention that HIPAA laws and PA's Mental Health Consent Law Act 65 of 2020, and I can provide copies if needed, protect a child's right to privacy relating to mental health information for children ages 14 to 17. She didn't mention that any other agency outside who provides mental health screenings in school is also bound by these laws, and if they violate them, they and the school could be sued. She also didn't mention that our current solicitor provided an opinion each year when the Samaritan Center was considered and felt that the opt-in process allowed for parents to be in control of this decision about parental rights. She didn't mention that once the board has voted on all issues, any material used to make that decision i.e. solicitors' opinions, becomes public knowledge. She did not mention that she was seeking input and advice from outside law firms not approved for work in Elizabethtown. She did not mention that her church and the church of two other members who are pastors at this church share an ideology of eliminating counselors at schools. How can we have members of our school board making decisions about our children's mental health when others with similar religious and political views can see mental health through a spiritual lens, citing a lack of faith, demonic influence, and prayer interventions, rather than a need for professional mental health services. Where have all these hidden truths gotten us? To a board that now wants to bring the most controversial law firm as a source of legal opinion. What's hidden in this move? The Independent Law Center is the legal arm for the PA Family Institute. The PA Family Institute has ties to Christian nationalist ideologies. Several of our board members also have ties to Christian national ideologies. Christian nationalism seeks to merge Christianity with national identity and public policy. These public policies oppose LGBTQ plus rights, want conservative Christian perspectives in public school and so many more controversial issues. What else is hidden? How convenient that you're trying to bring in the most controversial entity into the district during the summer months when many aren't paying attention or here to discuss. Conveniently, you're also trying to pass a policy that cuts our public speaking down to three minutes. Three minutes. Coincidence? I, I dare say not. Don't get me wrong. Everyone has a right to believe what they want to believe and worship or not worship, however they choose. My problem lies in when those personal ideologies are pursued and pursued with vigor in a school district where families and children come from a variety of backgrounds. None of you were elected with a supermajority of votes. As school board members, you were called to serve all children, white, black, brown, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, gay, straight, and trans, with equal justice and love. Love. We should all be guided by love. 
For a board who was elected on an issue of transparency, I implore you to stop with the hidden truths and agendas. Stop playing politics with our children. Mental health is an overwhelming crisis with teens and needs to be addressed openly, honestly, and with love. And please, don't bring more controversy by hiring the ILC. Help our kids, all our kids, and bring back the Samaritan Center screening and advocate for all our children. Bruce Kleindienst, uh, followed by Sue McDonald. I'm very saddened by your way of misusing taxpayer dollars by bringing in the ILC, which has a record of lawsuits and also for pay and have that we would have to pay for as taxpayers and a record of discrimination. Instead of quoting the Bible, you should start living the Bible. And you can start here with the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love only your white heterosexual neighbor. It says, love all your neighbors, black, white, gay, queer, all. I ask that you put aside your own secret agendas and start living or loving your neighbor and loving the children in this school system and doing what's best for our children. Good evening, board. My name is Sue McDonald. I'm the parent of a rising senior here at, at E-Town. I'm also an educator in a nearby district. My family is highly invested and involved in this community, and I'm a proud person in E-Town. I'm very concerned about the prospect of bringing in the ILC to our district. I don't need to review those concerns with you. You've heard them all. I couldn't live with myself if I sat at home tonight and didn't come here and speak to you about it. I heard you say tonight, there is no expense for bringing in the ILC. They're coming in to do their work pro bono. I can't put monetary dollars on the emotional expense and the safety of our children. And you are damaging that safety by bringing this firm in. I heard you say tonight that you want to invite new families into our district, and yet you're bringing in the ILC, which is not welcoming to others. I don't expect everybody here to listen or agree with me but I am here to talk to those who are open to hearing and our district admin and everyone else who can sound the alarm. Here's what I know. Our teachers and our admin are ad outstanding. We need to trust them. Our students and our staff deserve a place where they feel safe. The ILC is not going to afford that to them. It is not representative of the majority of our community values as a whole. As it's been stated, no one here has been elected with a supermajority. It potentially opens our district to litigation that will drain valuable resources from our staff and students. As a teacher with nearly 25 years of experience, only one singular truth has remained through my time from my college training until now. Students must feel safe in order to learn. The ILC undermines that safety for our marginalized students and we need to stop that. Thank you. All right, uh, Jason Deeds, followed by Paul Mumal. Good evening, board members. Is the responsibility of the board each of you as members to represent the best interests of the student body in its entirety. I believe retaining the Independence Law Center <clears throat> as an advisor in this capacity is a direct dereliction of your duties. Potential financial impacts, although the ILC will be quick to distract and dissuade that any of these policies have not been challenged in court or have maintained any legal liabilities imposed, it doesn't take a lawyer to see the potential civil light litigation of which I might be one of them. My daughter is a student here and is non-binary. She had fear in her eyes when she saw this. So my student is not safe. The ILC does not work for the districts. The ILC just works for its donors. They don't work free. I believe that in itself, this is a conflict of interest. The ILC's desire 
and says they're free of charge. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Robert Heinlein said it, and it still applies. The ILC wants to use you as a political pawn. They want controversy. We're going into a political election. They want to keep it on the minds of everybody. We don't need that for our students. They're the ones that are going to be the pawns, and you're putting them in that position. The ILC is controversial prepackaged policies that are designed purposely to divide us. We can do better on our own. On a personal note, I believe leadership through compassion and understanding. I know it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you are on. When we go home, we all sit at the dining room table and we talk about love, we talk about compassion, and we talk to our kids about what they've done each day, all of us. We have laughs, we have hopes, we have dreams. I know it's not every parent that's gonna agree with us, but I know that every parent agrees that we want to love and what is best for our children. And I ask that you do not do this because it's not best for our marginalized children. Good evening. I thank you for having me here and that we can speak to you. Thank you for all your good work and the time that you've put in on the school board. Uh, I know you dedicate a lot of your life to this job here, being here. Uh, my purpose tonight is basically to talk about taxes that you're going to be voting on here. Um, I am basically in favor of no taxes at all. I did send an email out to everybody. I hope everybody got it. I don't know if they read it, but um, the, the big thing is, you know, I can understand price increases. We all have them and we're all struggling with that now. In the Biden economy that we have, we're basically trying to make ends meet. And a lot of people are on fixed incomes. And so I think the idea is that we have to at least reduce a, a tax increase. I think um, one thing I think the, I know this was the last school board, but the ath athletic pro project was approved and there was no, they, we were told that there was no tax, not gonna be a tax increase. It wasn't, it was just, Neutral, you know, nothing must happen. Well, to me, if you rob Peter to pay Paul, sometime you're going to have to pay Paul back. And subsequently, we're at that point, and we're looking at increasing taxes. Now, that may be, I know you're talking about bonds and making money, you know, um, but the thing of it is, the whole thing is, is if we wouldn't be spending that 14, 16 million dollars that you're talking about for a Taj Mahal for the athletic athletic clubs, uh, would we even need a tax increase? That would be still in our budget. That would still be in our general fund, if I'm correct. So the other thing is, as I was sitting here listening to all this, I'm thinking man, our school, this school district is in dire financial condition. Man, we, we really need to get some taxes, get some money into this system. And I'm wondering how did we ever get to this point? How did we get to the point that, we're, that we need all this money all of a sudden? Um, the other thing is there, I didn't hear any talk anywhere about cuts. You know, one cent out of every dollar would give you an $82,000 savings out of the $82,000 budget. I know it was lowered to 79,000, okay, or 79 million. But anyhow, um, families are cutting their budgets and we need to look as a school board to do that also. I think there's gotta be some pressure. I think the school boards, the school directors are directors that should be influencing the administration to make decisions that benefit not only the school students and the teachers, but also the citizens of the community. So um, 
I don't know what our interest rate is. We talked about all this money, these millions of dollars that are in, in the bank that we have in reserve. I don't know what our interest rate is. I know members first down here will pay you 5% for an 11 month bond, for 11 month uh, investment. So anyhow, I also think that the second opinion for attorney, for an attorney's opinions is a great idea. Doctor second opinions with doctors save lives a lot of times. So I'm encouraged that you're looking at that. I think there should be second opinions on as many things as possible that helped to get you informed to make, make good decisions. So anyhow, I think that's about it for me. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. Up next, uh, uh, Andrea Stoner Lehman, uh, followed by Tom Miller. Hi, my name is Andrea Stoner Lehman. I live in Kanoi Township. I have two kids at the high school, and they've been in the district since kindergarten. Uh, one of the things my kids like to talk about is movies and how they're made and the other day we were talking about that scene that often shows up where there's this big scary shadow and the characters start to reach for something and quicker and quake in fear and then something comes into the light and it's just their friend or a neighbor or something they didn't need to fear after all and I feel like when um, transgenderism is looked at as this issue instead of people then it's frightening and scary and something that needs to be um, you know, put all kinds of policies in place to make things better. But in the end, when it comes into the light, it's a real person and it's real kids in our, our district. And they're not threatening. They're known to their classmates. One of the cool things about E-Town is a lot of these kids have known each other since kindergarten. Sometimes they've all known each other since fourth grade. And now with Bear Creek being third grade, sometimes since then. And they're not strangers, they're just trying like all kids to get through the school day and their parents, like all parents, just trying to keep their kids safe. Um, there have always been transgender persons. The only difference in 2024 is that people wanna accept them rather than reject them and making them hide. And so I'm just asking as you make decisions as a board, um, please remember that everything you say and do sends a message to these kids, these real E-Town school district kids, um, if they're valuable or if they're not. Thank you for your time. All right, we have Tom Miller followed by Timothy Runkle. Yeah, I wanna say thank you to each of you and uh, uh, Mr. Strickler and Dr. Nell. Uh, it's a lot of difficult decisions here. I really appreciate each one of you. Uh, does the school offer an elective course on cursive writing and uh, reading? If not, they should. Also, I support a cell, and the cell phone policy for students to prevent distractions from edu the education process. Um, and I'm, I'm offering again this year a Bible for any um, E-Town school district student that would like to have one, doesn't have one. My phone number is 717-823-8802. Also, I'm hosting a biblical citizenship class uh, beginning September 4th, adult or student would like to attend. It's an eight-week class, and, and I will host it in my home and, or via Zoom. The class is prepared by Patriot Academy and highlights the Judeo-Christian foundations of the United, the United States was established upon. Christianity is embedded in our country everywhere. Christianity is embedded especially in this region. We should not be part of smothering the legacy of faith in our community, especially schools through internal policies or classroom atmosphere. Constitutional liberties need to be released in public schools, including E-Town. I hope our solicitor is current on religious liberty cases and is prepared to defend them in our schools. Teachers and students and employees need to be aware of their constitutional liberties, including freedom of speech and religion. 
School choice is a popular policy. We need to make public schools attractive to Christians and Jews again. No weapon formed against you will prosper, and every word spoken against you we condemn. This is our heritage as servants of the Lord, and our righteousness is of him. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land, Leviticus 25.10. This directive is cast on the sides of our liberty bell in Philadelphia. And I proclaim liberty and religious freedom and the Pennsylvania motto of virtue, liberty, and in independence over Etown School District for students and faculty. We should not fear the traditional Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. It should be promoted. Faith in Almighty God brings hope and a sense of well-being, and this is why religious liberty in the public school is so vital to well-being. Pillar four, student well-being. The Etown educational experience should include faith opportunities for students and faculty. It is important and vital to well-being. I have read and heard and have come to believe that the Southern Poverty Law Center is run by wealthy white communists and has been described as a hate organization itself. Um, <clears throat> pro-life Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, and Jews, as well as Dr. Ben Carson, have been cited as hate organizations in person. The current SPLC, even though the SPLC, I believe, started well, they, uh, they focused on Ku Klux Klan, but currently they are attacking really good organizations. <clears throat> and it's... It's become a disgrace and does not honestly represent the poor or the black community in the United States. Its goal apparently is to divide and weaken our country. Pennsylvania Family Institute and the Independent Law Center are not hate organizations. They are reputable organizations that seek the best for children and families. The waronchildren.com movie exposes the effort to indoctrinate and groom children by way of on social media like TikTok, internet, and public school curriculum. Concerns over political indoctrination and sexual grooming by way of curriculum educators and influencers in the school or why the community voted for you. I hope you can address this concern during your term. <clears throat> All right, yeah. So uh, thank you for your time. I'm Tom Miller. All right, thank you. Uh, Timothy Runkle, followed by Alicia Runkle. Thank you. Hey, good evening, board members. Uh, tonight I'm asking you to support the governor's educational budget proposal by passing a resolution in support. The governor's budget proposal for education will provide an additional $1.6 million of savings and funds for the next school year. And it is fully paid for by the hoard of money sitting in the idle treasury of the uh, state. Yesterday, the House version HB 2370 passed the full House and moved on to the queue of the Senate Education Committee. Senator Allman is on that uh, committee as a seated member. And I ask you to publicly demonstrate supporting bringing $1.6 million to Elizabethtown for the school district. I provided you a draft resolution um, in your email, some of you attended meetings where, uh, where we discussed this. I think if you can call um, the, our state representative about $400,000 for a bus transportation, you can call them about $1.6 million in public education funding. However, I must say it's sad to see the board's attention is again focused on clickbait tonight instead of advancing realistic actions that can bring district money. Unfortunately, the residents of E-Town um, this board seems to be focused on pursuing book restrictions and the investigation of genitals, as indicated by the tonight's discussion to appoint a special counsel. It's public knowledge that ILC is the legal arm of the government lobbyist firm, PA Family Institute. That much is clearly stated on the organization's websites. You can just go there and look. The ILC provides free legal services because they're backed by PA families $2. million annually of special interest money. And they intend to 
They intend to, according to PA Family's mission statement, advance their agenda, agenda in the legal arena. That means they want to go to court. Their stated goal is to argue cases before court. There's a lot of eyes looking down. I don't know, un understand why nobody's paying attention up there. It's sad. President Lindemuth, three months ago, you told the newspaper that the board wasn't going to head this way with a solicitor. Yesterday, you told the newspaper that you've been meeting in executive discussions pursuing ILC's counsel. In fact, um, you've had special meetings with them. You know, it's not really a surprise that's been going on. In 2002, Director Lindmuth, uh, Danielle, you sent an email from your personal school board account to PA Family Institute asking that the legal counsel of ILC contact you about policies which you and Pastor Doug Lamb of LifeGate Church discussed during a meeting with Semek of IM's ILC. Why the pastor of LifeGate Church is involved in these policy discussions that the board is having is an interesting question. Two of you sitting on the stage are pastors at LifeGate. Another attends. Another is married into the family. Several of you had to recuse yourself from a vote because you're, of your commingled employment status. You know, it's, it, it's, it's significant to note that PA family has spoken at your church before, and you have brought PA family to your um, SPLC listed hate organization. I'm sorry, anti-government organization. No, you don't hate people there. You just kick me out all the time. And I'm only bringing this up because of the significance and the outside representation that this group has on the board. It's apparent that the board does not, cannot, and is not interested in representing the whole community, but just one group. I know that because at LifeGate, we're told about the enemies around us, the demons preventing you from enacting supremacist ideas in civil society. These are your neighbors who you've chosen to characterize as the vehicles of Satan, instead of fully functional human beings with opinions other than those of your own. And more frequent than not, these sermons are laced with a disdain for queers, a rejection of an education separate from the holy book and the marriage with an anointed political movement. It's not the first time a small group used this school board to impress their personal belief system on the whole of the community. And it's not the first time that a multi-million dollar organization was used to write school policy for the district. The school board in 1996 used the Concerned Women of America, that organization, to draft their pro-family resolution that brought national attention to the district for its declaration that queers aren't family. And now the school board is taking a similar path with the appointment of ILC. I want to encourage the board that ILC should not be appointed special counsel. They're clearly not impartial, have a specific agenda and interests other than the well-being of our school district. However, I don't believe that this legal, I do believe this legal counsel will be selected because most members on this board also are not impartial, have a specific agenda and are not interested in the well-being of the school district. Alicia Runkle, uh, followed by Amy Carr. Good evening. My name is Alicia Runkle. I'm a parent in the district. I have uh, two children, one in the high school, one in the middle school or elementary school. I'm deeply concerned and disappointed by the school board's decision to seek special counsel from the Independence Law Center. While my disappointment is great, it's not unexpected. Mr. Lindemuth, it appears this aligns with the agenda of your church, LifeGate, which seems intent on influencing our district by pushing a Christian nationalist agenda through the position on the board. This is what we tried to warn the community about when you have it's so dangerous, when you elect so many people who are associated with just one church, one Christian nationalist church. It seems like the plan was always to get you elected gain control over the board and impose these values on our schools. For those of you who align with this agenda, it feels like you are merely following the directives of LifeGate Church and other Christian nationalist organizations, rather than considering the diverse needs and beliefs of our entire community. However, I hold out hope that the rest of the board will reconsider and not support the involvement of the ILC. Our schools should be a place of inclusion and neutrality, 
free from the influence of any religious or political viewpoint. The Independence Law Center has a long and disgraceful history promoting discriminatory policies that target and harm the queer community. By aligning with the ILC, the school board is effectively endorsing an organization that actively works against the rights and dignity of our LGBTQ plus students and the community. This is not a matter, not just a matter of poor judgment. It is a clear signal that this board is complicit in perpetuating hate and intolerance. The ILC's record includes fighting against anti-discrimination protections and advocating for policies that allow blatant discrimination under the false pretense of religious freedom. Their agenda is clear, to impose a narrow, bigoted worldview that has no place in our community. Choosing the ILC as counsel sends a dangerous and harmful message to our students, family, and community members. It tells our LGBTQIA students and their allies that their rights, identities, and their safety are negotiable and secondary to, this, to your discriminatory agenda. This is unacceptable. Our school board should be committed to fostering a safe and supportive environment for all students, regardless of their beliefs, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Aligning with the ILC undermines this commitment and betrays the trust of those who depend on the board to protect and respect their rights. I ask that the school board revoke any association with the Independence Law Center. Choosing to work with the ILC is not just a poor decision, it is an outright endorsement of bigotry. We need leaders who stand up for justice and inclusivity, not just who side with those organizations that thrive on hate and discrimination. Okay, Amy Carr, followed by Wayne Lawton. Good evening. First, I would like to take the opportunity to wish the Elizabethtown School District staff and students a happy Pride Month. Queer people exist in every space, although they often do not feel safe enough to come out to those around them. If you wonder why Pride Month exists, I would encourage you to view the comments on any social media post about Pride. Inevitably, ugly, mean, homophobic, and transphobic comments make their way into the comments. The reality is that every queer person I have ever had the pleasure of knowing simply wants to exist. Like all of us, they want to exist in spaces where they are safe, loved, and equal. Our current societal climate does not allow that for queer people, especially kids, to feel this way. In a 2022 Trevor Project poll of 34,000 LGBTQ plus youth between the ages of 13 and 24 years old, 73% reported feeling symptoms of anxiety and 58% reported symptoms of depression. 45% said they had seriously considered suicide. For transgender youth, the numbers are even worse. One in four have actually attempted suicide. These numbers are staggering and here are some reasons that research shows why these kids feel this way. They're being bullied or actively discriminated against. According to the Trevor Report, 73% of LGBTQ plus youth reported that they have experienced discrimination based on their sexual orientation or gender identity at least once in their lifetime. Little or no family support. Lack of support by teachers and school administration. Lack of access to mental health care. Being threatened with conversion therapy. Being misgendered or not being called by their chosen name. It is not just queer kids that are impacted by mental health issues. Recent studies show that more than four, more than four in 10 students felt persistently sad or hopeless, and nearly one third experienced poor mental health, which is why it is incredibly concerning that the board recently voted to not renew a contract that would provide our students with a free mental health screening. The reason used has been explained, but it is not acceptable. As an elected leader, I would have expected any of you to come to that meeting with alternative suggestions, but you didn't. You voted no with a bogus reason and washed your hands clean of it. The only response we've been able to get so far is, I think the admin is looking at other options. As a side note to our admins, I do wonder how long you'll be comfortable continuing to let yourself be thrown under the bus by this board before you become sick of it. It's a common theme. 
However, if the board moves forward with engaging with the Independence Law Center, I see more of the blame game in your future. There is quite frankly no reason for this board to engage with the ILC, but anyone who has been following this school board knows exactly why they are looking to engage the ILC. We all know where this is going. Every one of you sitting on this board knows where this is going. Any of us who have been following you closely knows what's going to happen next. And your next steps will almost certainly cause harm to students at Elizabethtown School District. You will become one of those contributing factors to the decline in teens' mental health, particularly LGBTQIA students. There is still time for you to correct your course. Vote no to hiring the Independence Law Center and abandon your plans to target queer students. To the students in our student body who identify as LGBTQIA+, you are seen, you are valid, and you are perfect exactly as you are. Happy Pride Month. I am Wayne Lawton. I'm here to say thank you to this board for all that you do. Uh, I have attended three board meetings. This is my third board meeting in 35 years. So uh, I'm not real familiar with all this that's going on, but I'm just totally impressed. It's amazing what you guys handle. So I'm here to say thank you for giving of your time and of yourselves to do all that you do. I was thinking, <clears throat> what right do I have to come and say anything? Uh, you know, I'm, an, I'm getting old now and uh, <clears throat> I don't have, <clears throat> I don't have any children in the town school. I don't have any grandchildren, don't have any great grandchildren in the town school. And uh, <clears throat> of course I thought about this, that my wife and I, uh, we did, licensed child care here for 25 years in Elizabethtown. So a lot of the kids have come to Elizabethtown school and we've tried in having those children in our daycare, our child care, to teach them good values, to say thank you, to say please when they hit each other or bite each other or whatever, to say I'm sorry and so forth. So you know, we do have an interest in what is happening in the schools here. Plus, my wife told me today that we paid $3,494.66 last year uh, to, to, you know, to keep everybody happy. Uh, that didn't keep very many people happy. But anyway, we did our part. And so I guess I'm, what I'm saying is I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm going to say something here. And uh, I feel like I do have a right to say it. Well, yes, when you do a good job, I think you need to be thanked. In fact, it's very encouraging to me. I'm a pastor. And, you know, if somebody tells me I preached a good sermon, I just, I glow, you know. They don't tell me very often. One man told me that I preach real good funeral sermons, but you have to die to get one. Well, okay, <clears throat> I do what I can. I'm here because I read in the paper today that the local school board was inviting the Independence Law Center to come in and give some counsel here. And when I read that this group, this nonprofit law firm, works to preserve religious liberty, to promote marriage and the family, and to protect human life and improve education. And I just thought, I'm so glad that you are inviting this group to come here. And I just want to say thank you. I am very proud of you. God bless you. All right. Uh, next would be Paula Burke, followed by... Thea Hofstetter. Good evening. My name is Paula Burke. I'm a taxpayer and parent of children here in the district. 
You may wonder why I'm holding up a coffee mug. This is my favorite coffee mug. Um, and I, I don't know if my husband knows why this is one of my favorite coffee mugs, but it has a verse from Corinthians. And I got this from a pastor at my church. Love is patient, love is kind. And I think we've all heard that at weddings and maybe even funerals like the pastor before me talked about. In my church here in Elizabethtown, we believe that love is love. We marry gay people. We support and endorse peace, immigration, persons who have come here seeking relief from persecution in other countries. Love is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. That's my religious belief that I share at my house of worship, and I am protected to do so under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, just like all of you are in your private lives, and just like everyone here is free to worship or not worship in the manner in which we choose. However, the First Amendment also gives us something else very special that is protected by both the Pennsylvania Constitution and the United States Constitution. That First Amendment that allows us to worship as we see fit, in my case, to see Jesus as a loving creator who loves us all, no matter what, gay, straight, bi, black, white, poor, undocumented. That's my freedom of choice in my home worship community. But that's what I do with my children in our home worship community. That is not a decision that is to be made here by elected officials. And if I may take you back 20 years ago and give you a very concrete example of why that is a very poor public policy choice that will then impact our taxpayer dollars. If that's the only thing that matters to some folks, let's bring it home to the taxpayer dollar. In the Dover Area School District some 20 years ago, a number of elected school officials officials were persuaded by an outside nonprofit legal services organization, well-meaning, um, that they should endorse something called intelligent design. Intelligent design was a um, system that was promoted that creationism um, should be taught in the schools, essentially, to shorthand it. Um, during the course of of passing this um, policy to be taught in the Dover Area School District, school board members brought with them their own personal religious beliefs. Those religious beliefs should have been checked at the door because of the very First Amendment that we've been talking about. And I wanna read from you, uh, the Honorable John E. Jones, who now is the president of Dickinson College, but at the time was a federal judge in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. He authored an opinion striking down um, the intelligent design policy, and awarding attorney's fees. And the taxpayers of Dover were on the hook for $2 million. There was significant litigation. There were depositions. The board members were deposed. One of the board members, this is on page 124 of the opinion, said, in his resignation, there has been a slow but steady marginalization of some board members. Our opinions are no longer valued or listened to. Our contributions have been minimized or not acknowledged at all. A measure of that is in the fact that I myself have been asked twice within the past year if I was born again. No one has nor sh should have the right to ask that of a fellow board member. An individual's religious beliefs should have no impact on his or her ability to serve as a school board director nor should a person's beliefs be used as a yardstick to measure the value of that service. After the court in Harrisburg considered pages and pages of testimony, they found that the school board members who endorsed religion, a particular kind of religion, a particular brand of religion, violated the First Amendment. I'm asking you not to enter into an agreement with the Independence Law Center for many reasons, including have we looked at malpractice issues? Have you talked to the current solicitor? Have there been violations of the Sunshine Act in meeting privately with this firm? In fact, there are criminal and civil penalties for Sunshine Act violations. Don't do it. Respect my freedom of speech and my freedom of religion.
All right, Thea Hofstetter followed by Chet Williamson. Good evening. First, I would like to say that I disagree with the update to policy 903 that changes public comment time to three minutes. While I understand that meetings can get long, especially when there are issues that our community is passionate about, it is, a ch is, it is challenging at times to provide feedback and the data or justifications for what we're sharing so that you can understand where we're coming from in five minutes, let alone three. I know that we're welcome to email the board, and I've done that to provide follow-up with specific links and information related to my com comments. But unfortunately, it can be challenging to accurately determine someone's tone in an email, and it's harder to keep someone's attention in written communications. As a result, I feel it's important for the community to continue to have the full five minutes to explain ex and express oneself during public comment. Second, there has been a lot of misinformation and name calling during public comment tonight. The Independence Law Center is a firm that specializes in constitutional and public policy law. Unfortunately, many speakers would rather spread hate than to actually examine the kinds of policies that they help with. In fact, the policies they have drafted in other districts have helped communities respect everyone in a balanced and thoughtful way. Let's stop with the slander and start debating actual policies. When we do, I believe we'll be glad for what the Independence Law Center has to offer, and I appreciate their willingness to provide special counsel for our district at no additional expense to our taxpayers. Finally, as I've shared before, based on the financial information available to the public on the district website, there is valid justification not to approve a budget with a 3.75% tax increase, the highest tax increase in six years. I recognize the importance of being fiscally responsible and having a down payment for the upcoming middle school high school complex renovation rebuild and maintaining a good rating for when we need to borrow for that project. The solicitor mentioned needing to have a good down payment and demonstrating increases in taxes as part of the criteria for good rating. As for the down payment, as of June 30th of last year, the district had 19.9 million set aside for future facility improvements between the general and capital funds. Add to that the 1.2 million that was just received from the sale of bonds and the extra million dollar in bonds beyond what was needed to pay itself back for the athletic project, both of which must be used for capital improvements. That makes 22.1 million in taxpayer money already saved and earning interest for the district. That means we already have about 20% down for a project that's expected to be about 100 million or maybe some more. As for demonstrating increases in taxes, the district has included tax increases of at least 2.68% every year for the last 10 years, which is the furthest back data was available. Anything over no increase, 0% is an increase. So bringing the current budget down to a maximum of 3% is not going to negatively affect that rating. I also recognize that the majority of revenue the district receives is out of the board's control and that there's no guarantee for the amount that will come in next year from state and federal sources but it's no reason to allow fear to outweigh the current reality. Look at where the district currently stands. The district has received over 100% of its budgeted revenue in eight of the last nine years, which is as far back as the records were available. It had about $25 million in taxpayer funds earning interest for the district as of a year ago, and is on track to increase that total again this year as of last month. That combined fund balance includes over $22 million towards the upcoming project. The district is already in a pretty good place while our community is struggling with paying bills and buying necessities. Please don't approve the 3.75% tax increase. The highest increase in six years is extreme and an unnecessary strain on our community. Thank you. Regarding the Independence Law Center, I too agree that a second opinion is a very good thing, but I don't think a second opinion is what y'all are looking for. I think you're looking for an opinion that will mesh perfectly with what you want to do regarding policy. I'm a taxpayer. I've lived in this area my whole life, and I don't want to see, I'd rather see my tax dollars go to the students, to the school, rather than to some law problems that we're going to have as a result of using this organization. I'm also a homeowner. Maybe I'd like to sell my home someday. I'm gonna see my property values dive as a result of what you guys might be doing. I just wanna remind you back 
in 1996, there was a school board that had a religious agenda. And the meetings then that were packed, the high school auditorium was filled. We had national coverage. Everybody knew what was happening in Elizabethtown. And that board, as a result, was voted out. If they are remembered today at all, they are remembered as clowns. And I would just like to caution you that this can happen again. And it will, because so far you're making that 1996 school board look like an all-star team. Uh, Lori Longenecker, followed by Don Lamb. Good evening. So the proposed budget for the 24-25 the um, year, as I understand it, is is like 82 million, or maybe that number came down on the slides tonight. Um, in contrast to the budget from 2014 to 2015, which was uh, about 52.78 million, that would make it an increase of nearly 30 million or just 75% in just 10 years. I doubt that the average taxpayer's income increased by the same amount in the same span of time. I actually looked back at our records and our family budget and our budget increased less than 9% in 10 years. So while the district spending has increased, the enrollment has been decreasing since 2020 and two schools have been shut and sold. So it seems to me that spending should be going down, not up. Um, in regard to the Independence Law Center controversy, I decided to look into the group and also into the um, Southern Poverty Law Center, which labeled them as a hate group. So the Independence Law Center website states, we defend human life at all stages and defend the rights of the people to freely exercise their religion as well as all the other First Amendment freedoms that depend on that first freedom. We protect and advance these and other self-evident truths through advocacy in courts of law and courts of public opinion and through legislative, local, and educational policy development. Sounds like they're protecting uh, the Constitution. So my question is, does that mean that the Constitution is hateful? Well, I went to the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it seemed to me that um, they labeled other groups that teach and support the Constitution as hate groups. Uh, these groups are ironically labeled anti-government, which puzzled me. Um, and one of those groups, which has been referenced tonight, um, I know has in their meetings do the Pledge of Allegiance, the Constitution and U.S. history are taught, elected officials are speakers. So I'm not sure how that makes the group anti-government unless the Southern Poverty Law Center is against our own constitutional republic. As I looked over their list of hate groups, it seemed to me that it would be more accurate for them to label the groups as those groups whose ideology is opposed to ours. But of course, that wouldn't plump their endowment nearly as much as hate does. Um, I also discovered that the SBLC does not view Antifa as a hate group. So I would ask who gets to decide who is a hater? Based on what I found, I don't think the SBLC is a very good judge. So I wouldn't let them decide on what criteria should a hater be convicted? Uh, but that's another problem with the SBLC's list. There has been no trial or conviction. No broken laws have been the cause of groups landing on the list. They just are put there because someone deems them to be hate groups. To me, it seems to defy common sense that anyone has the right to call another a hater simply for holding to an opposing view. To sum up, I think the decision to accept the offer of the Independent Law Center services without cost is a no-brainer. And another question, um, I'm not, I'm kind of puzzled why any of our children would be anxious about a law firm giving advice to a school board. Um, that's, that puzzles me, I'm not sure, but thank you for your time.
All right, Don Lamb followed by Donna Coble. Thank you. Greetings, President Lindemuth and the entire Elizabethtown School Board, faculty and administration. Thank you for all that you do. Please, please, please limit us to three minutes. Please, please, please take us down to three minutes. Please. Um, you guys need big shoulders. You guys need big hearts. You need strong spines and you need sharp minds. And I thank you that you are endeavoring to do that. And uh, I'm very offended on your behalf by the condescending spirit many people speak to you as whether we agree or disagree with you, we respect you. Every issue that the government looks at right now in America from local school boards to the Supreme Court have moral implications and no law or policy that's being decided is not debated because it does have impact on anyone that it is going to touch. One of the first things that comes to me is we need to teach in our public school, schools that disagreeing with someone is not dehumanizing them. We need to just push it with all we got. We have this narrative that if I disagree with you, I dehumanize you. If I disagree with your choices, I dehumanize you. That's gotta stop. So we're still in this cultural debate for hearts and minds of all the Americans, and this school board is no different. It's the same all across America. We realize tonight we're a divided, we're a divided um, morally uh, trajectory community, but I believe we still love each other. Um, breaking news, you don't come into any meeting neutral. You don't bring into a, a school board a neutrality. Everyone has their worldview. And... Uh, if you stand against a particular secular moral trajectory to today in America, um, you're going to have these boilerplates of shaming tactics brought against you. And the opportunity presents itself tonight because you guys decided to look into the independence uh, law firm. And so now we're, talk, we're told you are interested only in clickbait. You are an anti-LGBQ2 per person. You're, ant you're, you're transphobic. You're anti-blankety-blank. You're a Christian nationalist. You're a Christian dominionist. You're bigoted. You're, you have repressive policies. You're discriminating against us. You're promoting reactionary Christian values. And you are deliberately provocative. Well, I'll tell you honestly, I think all of us in this room that would disagree with that boilerplate is that we are anti-wrongheaded secular morality, we are anti-pornography, we are anti-sexual anarchy and gender confusion, we are anti-shame everyone who disagrees with you, but we are pro-logically make your argument and then let the, let the chips fall where they may in the community. But just because you disagree with me doesn't make you Christian phobic. Remember, those who want religious, religionless moral ethics in America can be called secular dominionists, just as we are called Judeo-Christian dominionists. It's simply a clash of worldviews. Our Constitution gives us each the rights and the privileges to disagree tonight. We saw that. But may there be greater civility in our community than we've seen tonight. We have to respect that. As a community, we can use this as a learning opportunity how to communicate clearly to your neighbor, even though they hold a different worldview while not despising them. Calling them names, shaming them, calling them oppressors, reminding others that they are reactionary or dangerous while you hold a different worldview and when practically all those de definitions can be said about yourself doesn't win the day. Everyone wants their worldview pushed. They believe it's correct. What is your version of empathy or your version of inclusion? If it does not fit your version, do you vilify your opponent? What's the difference? How does your empathy hold when people disagree with you? There are kids who don't believe what other kids value. We have to figure out how to work this out. We don't have to hate each other while we disagree. We can respect the other person's due diligence, even if they land on an issue completely opposite of ourselves. And the huge catchword in our generation is discrimination. But someone going, someone's going to be discriminated against no matter who wins this argument. The secular left doesn't want you to talk about this just so it fits their pet issue. We can roll our eyes and sigh a lot in this crowd all night long, but the reality is we still must go forward even with this cultural clash. We have to acknowledge that. The scolding 
that is made about us is, but you're trying to control us. Oh, yes, well, you're trying to control us. It's all about control. However, good leadership learns through dissent and disagreement. Thank you. All right, Donna Coble is up next, followed by Kevin Shorner Johnson. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the board. And I'm telling you, I think this is terrible here tonight. I have to commend you that you have to sit here and listen to this. But past that, I'm here to talk about the taxes. But I do want to thank you all for your time and the energy and the effort that you put into this. So my comments are pertaining to the proposed tax increase. And I want to remind you that those of you who voted for you, that those of us that who have voted for you are expecting you to hold the line on the taxes. We are all feeling the crunch of the current economic status. We cannot increase our household budgets by 3% every year. And yes, so it is disheartening that the government decision makers don't seem to know how to make um, make a, make do with less. Please remember that any tax increase this year is on top of the increase we have had in the last uh, year and the year before and the year before that. I was very was very encouraged to hear Mr. Strickler assure the board that he will balance the budget. I was not encouraged to hear him say this initial budget was made up of the wish list of the ones who uh, submitted members to him. I would think that it would be much better to ask what the bare minimum is needed. And uh, at the May 14th board meeting, it was indicated that there was significant interest from outside parties in buying the district's bonds and that this interest resulted in 1.2 million that is essentially a gift that those that doesn't have to be paid back. This 1.2 million needs to be reserved for capital improvements, which is also one of the reasons we are told that the taxes are being raised. If the benefit of this unexpected windfall is passed back to the taxpayers over the course of three years to the tune of 400,000 per year. That alone could be justified for decreasing the tax raise to only 3% for this coming year. I would like to see this board hold the line on the tax increases as our taxes have been raised year after year after year, while our income has likely not increased nearly the same rate. Plus, everybody knows groceries, everything's going up, and yet we don't get increases in our income. So I would hope that this can be voted on really good tonight. Thank you.
Good evening. As a parent, I want to note my opposition to the proposed relationship with the Independence Law Center. They advertise as advocating for religious liberty, marriage, family, and human life. I find their past actions to be in opposition to these values. I find the spirits of their meetings and their agendas to be opposed to the kinds of community that I believe are a core part of what I want to see here in Elizabethtown. Free advice always comes with bias and political agenda. Anything that appears free always has a cost. I ask the board to not seek any relationship with the Independence Law Center. Thank you. All right, Rhonda Myers. Good evening, I'm Rhonda Myers. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I work in this community. I have a private practice here in Elizabethtown um, and I have three daughters who graduated from Elizabethtown Area School District. I'm here tonight to express my concern about two issues. First, at the board meeting, last board meeting, you voted to decline the Teen Hope Mental Health Screening Program that's provided by Samaritan Center. This program exists to screen students for depression and suicide risk. If a student is identified as at risk, Teen Hope collaborates with the parent and the student to connect them with local mental health services. Etown participated in this program for several years and at risk students were helped. It's my understanding that the program at Etown actually was offered as an opt in program which meant that parents had to give permission for their student to be screened. Parents' rights were never at risk. They were never in jeopardy, as you seem to believe. So I'm asking that you not allow um, unfounded fears to prohibit mental health screenings that are so vital and necessary. According to the 2021 Pennsylvania Youth Survey, 38.5% of Lancaster County teens say that they have been depressed or sad for most days of the last year. Approximately 18% of the students admit to having considered suicide and 10% have actually made a suicide attempt. Early intervention is necessary and effective. Why would you decline a community service that will support student mental health and possibly save lives? This service is funded through grants and private donations through the Teen Hope Program. It is not funded by E-Town taxpayers. I heard several of you comment tonight regarding the ILC that more information is better. Why would you turn away from a free service that would provide parents and school teachers and administration with information to help students? The second concern is your consideration of engaging the Independence Law Center as quote, special counsel. The ILC is an affiliate of Pennsylvania Family Institute, which is an organization whose mission is, and I quote from their website, to restore the public, to restore to public life the traditional foundational principles and values essential for the well-being of society. And their well website goes on to define family as quote, marriage between one man and one woman. However, the Elizabethtown District website states that, quote, the board declares it to be the policy of this district to provide an equal opportunity for all students to achieve their maximum potential through the programs and activities offered in the schools without discrimination on the basis of race, color, age, creed, religion, sex, sexual orientation, ancestry, national origin, marital status, pregnancy, or handicap or disability. The ILC does not seem to be concerned with protecting the rights of students who fall outside of the Pennsylvania Family Institute's narrow definition of family and its particular religious views. So what is the reason for engaging their services when you just recently voted to continue engagement with the two law firms that you already have? Whether, whatever your personal 
political, whatever your personal political or religious views are, you still have an obligation to ensure that all the students of the district are provided equal opportunity that's free from discrimination. Thank you for hearing me. Okay, um, <clears throat> policy 903 states that the board requires that public participants be residents or taxpayers of this district or anyone having registered a legitimate interest in a contemplative action of the board. Anyone representing a group in the community or school district, and it, it goes on, any representative of a firm eligible to bid on materials or services. <clears throat> so with that being said, uh, we have a person here who would like to speak. He's representing a group. Uh, I'm going to allow it based on this policy as written. Um, this will not this will not be an option come August. So please uh, be mindful of your five minutes and please be respectful of what you're saying. Thank you. Hi, I'm Parker Webb, he, they, executive director of Let It's Chooses Love and transgender man extraordinaire. Side note, I'm very glad to hear you'll be inviting Let It's Chooses Love to educate and consult with your board. We do provide free education, and your board has stated that you would be very remiss to turn down any free education. And we would be happy to match the number of hours that the ILC has dedicated to your board. We are a local 501c3. We run a food bank two days a week, every Wednesday night from 5 to 8 and every Wednesday morning from 9 to noon. I found that information very helpful for those in our school district. I know you'll be hearing facts and costs about uh, regarding the ILC. I'm here to, sh to spend my time sharing words from people hurt by discrimination against our transgender community in Lancaster County. First, a message from Holly Snyder, mother of Braden Snyder, lost to suicide in October of 2022. In honor of Braden's birthday, losing Braden is every day inconceivable and unbearable. As we continue to miss our Braden, we ask that each of you think of us or Braden, that you use that as a reminder to ask yourself if you're being kind, if you're being the kind of person in this world that shows others that their lives matter no matter what. That when you see someone different from you, you are slow to form an opinion, but quick to see them through the lens of grace and love. In honor of Braden, we hope that you have chosen to speak kinder about people at all costs, because we were made to love first, not judge. May you find yourself quoting this to yourself and others. Love slows us down to form a relationship with a person rather than a judgment of a person. We are all not that different, and we believe it's incredibly important that we start to remember this. We have heard multiple stories of how Braden noticed people, made them feel special, stood up for them, and showed them they mattered. In honor of Braden's birthday, May 1st, we want to follow Braden's example. On Monday, we will hope you will join our family in choosing to send a ripple of love back out into our community by performing small acts of kindness. Even just one can make a difference for that one person. Our hearts remain broken, but love will pull us forward. River Olmsted was quoted in an article titled A Mother's Plea, We Are Failing Our Children to Death, just before they were lost to suicide late 2023. A peer once cited a love of God and America as reasons why they could not, in good conscience, call me by anything other than my legal first name, a very supportive teacher at my school told me that they would love to step in to support me, but that because of the religious nature of the school, it would risk their job. It's so strange how Christian schools tell you that the number one important thing is kindness, but when it comes to basic acceptance, there are so many unlesses in small print that in practice, they end up discriminating against anyone who actually exhibits and stands up for that kindness. Ashton Clatterbuck was a transmasculine advocate who spoke up strongly for his community before being lost to suicide. 
Making it illegal to be transgender does not stop people from being born transgender. Closing your eyes doesn't make us go away. The anti-LGBTQ plus political stunts we see around the country masquerading as religious freedom and mild piety, or moral piety are doing real harm to queer Americans. Only about 1.2 to 1.8% of Americans identify as transgender. According to a study done by Wild Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, this makes for an easy target. And it seems you know this. Until new laws direct strict, uh, directly restrict your own rights and liberties, it can be easy for most to ignore their effect. In Tennessee, a new law bans all adult-oriented entertainment, including male and female impersonators, in any setting that might be in view of minors. This establishes grounds for anyone to press charges against a transgender woman for just existing in public. A drag queen innocently walking from the parking lot into a bar, if spotted, may be handcuffed and charged. The ambiguity of the Tennessee law presents a, a grave threat to the safety of transgender individuals. Does this law make it illegal for any man to wear a dress? Paint their nails? This is a whole article you can read in the LNP. Just a reminder, I am still legally female. So if you do make any laws about bathroom policies and things like that, I'll be in the women's room. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public comment time. Uh, thank you everyone for your comments. We need to move to action items here. We do have a few items tonight, uh, four on the action, action item list. So uh, most of these are financial in nature, at least the first three. So um, I'm going to yield my time to Mrs. Linda Muth to look for motions. All right, so the first thing that we have on the agenda is the resolution um, to approve the final budget. Um, so we're making a resolution to approve the final budget. So moved. So we had a motion and a second. Second. All right, so at this time we'll do the vote on Mr. So yeah, we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? No question or comments? I'd like to make a comment. I believe Mr. Strickler did an excellent job in presenting the review of the budget that we had already approved back in May. Um, I think to lower the 3.75 at all would be fiscally irresponsible in light of all that he shared tonight of expenses that we don't know about, uh, special ed, possibilities, uh, health insurance, and so on, I think uh, we'd be wise to maintain the 3.75% increase. Any other comments? I do wanna thank uh, Mr. Strickler for answering all my questions. I had a lot and I appreciate you taking time to answer them and do the presentations so that everybody could see publicly. Um, I know I personally spent a lot of time on this. It is not something I took lightly. Um, I researched, I met with people, I talked to people, I read things I never thought I'd be reading like audits and budgets from many years ago till today. Um, and I'm learning a lot. And um, this is not definitely not something that I'm taking lightly. Um, having said that, I do not think it would be fiscally responsible for us to do less than 3.75 as well. My comment is this, <clears throat> if our school district was a car, we're driving a 1950s flathead and we're getting two miles to the gallon. We can throw new tires on it. We can put new engine in it. We can put a transmission in it. We can put new tires on it, but we're still driving a 1950s flathead. That's where our problem is. We can keep on putting good money into an old 50s, or we can move into something that is 
a little bit more economical that suits our needs, that it's going to be easier to maintain and safer for our students. We can't do that if, if we're going to say, well, I can't get a loan for it. And I know this pains me because when we started here, we all agreed to a 3%. It's not about what the stuff is costing is what our future is. And if we keep on going the direction that we're going and, and just renovate our school, we're going to be probably spending 60% renovating than if we just build a new school. I don't know what the numbers are going to be, but we need to go in that direction to find out. And I can only say that that's where my mind is. If we're going to make that decision, and I know that, you know, we can drag that out for another 10 years and we can keep spending money in our district in heating systems and AC systems with you know remodeling but we're still driving a 1950s flathead um and this school is not meeting our needs as far as you know keeping it restrained to what our students actually need um so i mean that's where i'm at I would love to say that I would love to go to a 3%, but that hasn't been made tonight, meaning that if it was that we could cut our finances down, that it wouldn't affect the money that we got from the bond and we could cut, you know, out to get it down to 3% and we know where the money's coming from, I'm good for that, but we can't. So I'm still at 375. I would say that um, we have been putting money aside for the project that's coming ahead. Um, we have been doing our due diligence by planning ahead with this bond. We are going to be putting money aside um, with the resolution at the next meeting, the $7 million we're going to be setting aside and the $2 million next year. I do believe that we are addressing that. Um, I don't agree with the fact that we can't have some savings in this. I do believe that we need to remember that um, we do represent our entire community and we have a very large community that is asking us to hold the line at a lower rate. Um, originally, when we had talked about this, we had said 3% and we would go up to 375 if we were going to do a resolution for our elderly. The resolution was turned down. We decided that was not in the best interest of our district and yet we still stayed at 375. If we could have been at 3% and only go up if it was for the um, resolution for the elderly, then why are we continuing to be at 375? 3% was good enough at that point, 3% should be good enough now. Any other comments? I will say uh, myself, um, you know, I, I echo kind of what was said here. I mean, the senior tax rebate was was uh, nullified. We decided not to do that. Uh, that essentially saved us $350,000, from my understanding, if I remember correctly. Uh, we seem to have found the money for the band uniforms. Um, there, There is uh, some savings in terms of uh, attrition um, and some other things that Mr. Strickler mentioned, uh, we are going to be seeing tax revenue coming in here, uh, perhaps late July, early August. So it's not like we're gonna be hurting for cash right away. Uh, and also I think I think we can say with pretty confidently say that our, our budget in Harrisburg, uh, you know, we're not going to see a decrease in funds. Uh, they'll be coming through eventually. Uh, so we always seem to have, if you follow the budget the last several years, um, yes, it's gone up, 
but we always seem to have it seems like there's always an extra two to three million dollars at the end of the year so i think some of these fears are a little unfounded so i would recommend not voting for the 375 and, and doing something at least half a percent lower i'm just going to chime in quick here um i'm really really on the fence here um i'm a homeowner in elizabethtown and I completely understand the burden of, of, of the tax increases. Um, as, as, a, as a vice president on this board and uh, as a taxpayer, as a community member, um, my heart's at 3%. As the facilities chair and what I know we're up against, um, I know full well what we're up against, probably um, even including Jim Fonts here, uh, uh, probably know better than anybody in this room what we're gonna be up against here. Um, I've done my homework, I've investigated it, I've checked things out, I've looked at archives, I've been in the tunnels, I've been on the roof, I've been everywhere you can be in this in this school um, and all the other ones as well. If if we stay at if we stay at three percent, what happens next year? When there's an election year, when our constituents are saying we want zero percent or we want two percent and we can't give it to them because we stayed at 3%. We're gonna need borrowing power that's beyond the borrowing power that we have at the moment. Doing this is going to affect that. I just, you, everyone needs to understand that. Doing this is going to affect our borrowing power. It's been, it's been presented there is a lot of unknowns as to what we're up against here in the near future. Um, we just saw the rug get pulled out from under us on transportation just today. This is, this is a, an, an immensely tough decision to make. And no matter which way any one of us on this board goes, there are gonna be people that are unhappy. It doesn't matter what is decided. There are going to be people unhappy. Um, but the people that don't deserve to be unhappy is the ones we represent most here, and that's the students. They need what they need. I'm not saying that they need the Taj Mahal. Um, you know, Bear Creek looks like an airport to me. It looks like a waste of money, to be honest with you. Not saying, I'm not saying any of that. But they need what they need. And right now, this building is costing us Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid to try to struggle to give them what they need. As a community member, as a homeowner, like a, just like everybody else in this room, I hate the idea of, you know, I, I work every day myself. I was laying brick today. I hate the idea of, of raising taxes. But I, but I, I think I struggle with not doing what's right. Um, not just for the community, but for the buildings that I've been entrusted with is something that could, that could potentially keep me up at night. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what I'm for or not for. I'll, I'll cast my vote. I just, I just wanted to take a few seconds here and let everybody hear my heart. Thank you.
Any others? All right, uh, why don't we go to a vote for this resolution for the final budget? Roll call vote. So, Mrs. Maxwell? Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Emery? Yes. Mr. Gillis? No. Mrs. Lindemuth? No. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Riggleman? Yes. Mrs. Shrum? No. Mrs. Wilson? No. Mr. Lindemuth? I am a no. All right, so the resolution did not pass. Um, that does mean that, that does mean that the next two items um, will have to be postponed because they cannot be um, taken care of at this time. And we will need to give direction to our finance chair and the district as to what we are looking for. Um, so at this point, we're going to have to come to a consensus so that we can give direction to Mr. Strickler of what percentage rate we are looking at. Um, Mr. Strickler, that is a consensus vote, correct? Okay. Um, so I know that many of us have talked about 3%. Um, since the resolution did not pass, we need to come to a consensus about what that is. I would propose that it would be 3%. Discussions or yeses or nos? I agree. Um, 3%. I would also like to say that next year I would be looking for a 0%. I think 11 years in a row of tax increases is enough. Uh, with how we're split with our voting, is it possible to find a middle ground and do 3.25? We're going to need a little more. I was going to say, we, we're going to need direction tonight. Yes. Um, just so the board is aware of how this will impact our meeting schedule for the next couple of weeks. Um, we have a a hard PDE deadline by June 30th um, to give Tom adequate time, Mr. Strickler adequate time to work with the business office on developing a new budget based on whatever parameters you give us this evening. Um, in addition to the requirements we have to advertise a meeting like this, um, we will need to have a meeting next Tuesday on the 18th. Um, the reason we can't wait until the 25th is by the week of the 25th, we need to be printing tax bills and getting them out, as was explained in the presentation earlier. Um, so whatever direction the board gives us this evening, um, we will uh, need that before we can go any further, so. All right, so we have people saying three and people saying three, two, five. Um, I'm gonna need you guys to engage and give us. I would say, <clears throat> I would say three because that's what we were told was adequate last year. I'll echo this again by our financial uh, chairperson and our, our committee. Uh, they said 3% would be good for the next five years. I think we need to find a way to make it work, even though it's tough. Uh, I will also say that we are looking here. There's been a lot of talk about the, the new building project. Ultimately, what we're looking to looking for here is a year-to-year -year budget to pay for our operating expenses. We're going to need we're going to need to borrow regardless uh, in order to build a project. So, if we've already got fifteen to twenty million uh, stashed away from the sounds of things, we've got a good foothold there already. So, I would say three. I can live with three, two, five, but I would prefer three. 
I would vote for 3.25. I could go 3.25. In addition to the rate, we're also going to need a little bit of direction from the board in terms of what areas you would like us to reduce further because the budget that we presented um, at the direction of the board at the 3.75 included the reductions um, that we recommended. So we're going to need a little bit of input so that we can go back to the drawing board to see where else we can tighten the belt a little bit. Mr. Strickler, is the board um, able to direct you to use fund balance to come to that balance? You can direct me whatever you want. I am, again, as your finance person, strongly, strongly suggest using your fund balance. If we need a million dollars in health care this year, I don't know where we're coming out. If we need it and you take your fund balance down, I may be back to you saying in December, January, February, saying we've got to freeze spending. What do you want to freeze? I'll do whatever you tell me to do. You are the board. I take your direction. I'd like two things from you. One, I need some type of guarantee that if I come back next Tuesday, it's not going to change again because we've talked 375 since beginning of April. And I'm not arguing with the board. You do whatever you want. I will follow that direction. But my concern is I don't have time. You don't have time next week to change it. We've got to have, be able to come back and you say, this is what you want. If you want three, tell me what to cut. I'll come back with three. You want three, two, five. Tell me what to cut. I'll come back with three, two, five. The administration will work to what you tell us, but please, we are dire with the deadline. We can't lose interest and also try to reduce the tax rate. Just, that's from your financial advisor. I'll do whatever you tell me. Okay. All right, we need people to decide on the rate. So if you haven't given your number, I need a number, please. 3.25. Okay. Three, all right. You said three, yep. 3.25. 325. Well, I would I would prefer three. Do you have me down? I believe so. And I'm at three. I've missed somebody. So it's three, 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 two, five, three, two, five, three. Okay. So it is 3.25. So what's that put us at? What's the difference there? $200,000 is what we're going back to going. So where would you like me to slice $204,000? 200, 240. 204. 204. The 600,000 that we have not put over into um, capital reserve, that would offset what we need. So it would make sense since we were setting that money aside for a just in case, this seems like a just in case. trying to cut everywhere we could. And I know the public doesn't see that because it's in closed meetings, but we did. And I I can't, I don't know where you'd cut anymore except telling people they're, it's their last day. So, I mean, that's where we're at. I would like to just make a, a comment. First, I'd really like to thank publicly Mr. Strickler for all of his work um, 
he has done a tremendous amount of work over the last month to try to get answers to questions and provide you with information to make an educated decision. I also feel compelled to respond. Uh, there have been a few times during some of our public comment where folks have referred to administrative wish lists. Um, and I feel it necessary on behalf of my administrative team to defend their efforts a little bit in the preparation of the budget. I absolutely respect that this is a board decision in terms of what you do. And, and Mr. Strickler and I will work together to get something prepared for next week. But I think there's a misconception that our administrative team just willy nilly picks and chooses um, all these frivolous, fluffy, nice to have items. Um, do we sometimes talk about the things that would be nice to have? Of course we do, don't we all in our, our normal everyday lives and our budget process? Um, but we do try our very best to be reasonable, to be fiscally responsible. Um, so I do wanna thank all of my administrative team and my business office who worked really hard um, over the last three or four months putting this together. Um, so again, I respect that it's the will of the board and we will get this ready for next week, but I, I didn't want that to go unnoticed. I wanted to correct that misperception. You do realize, Dr. No Dr. Now, that that was actually said. It's not something that people just came up with. I, I, I do, because I, I, remember, I remember it coming up in one of the presentations, and to be perfectly honest, I think it was just the poor choice of words. It this happens when we have presentations, when we're talking to you, when we're trying to answer questions off the cuff. Um, a wish list, it is, it's an, a list of items that would be important to us. Um, wish is probably a poor choice of words, but it doesn't defend, it, it doesn't detract from the effort that we made to be responsible and asking for what we believe is right for our kids. So I, I will acknowledge that. I just wanted you, I didn't know if you were aware that that actually was said. And that's I was. Why some people have uh, yes, I, I'm aware that that's what was said, but I don't believe that was the intention of the I word. Know. Yeah. But I mm -hmm. stick my foot in it all the time. And I didn't think that was even sticking your foot in it. It was just one of those things that people are like, I don't want any more taxes and I'm hearing about wish lists. That's all. I, I do think it was an unfortunate and I think we all want what's best for our kids. Okay. So when we have the opportunity to brainstorm and think about what kind of school we want, what kind of curriculum we want, what kind of buildings we want, what kind of materials we want, we want the best for our kids. So that's what we're going to ask for. We do absolutely understand that um, we all want what's best for our kids, but we also have to work within the constraints of what we have available to us. and. Our community has spoken to us at a resounding level to let us know that what we have available, we cannot continue to spend, 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 and have it not affect us the way that it is affecting everybody. And there is a, a limited amount of resources in this community. And my concern is that we are getting to that limit of what we can continue to ask for from our constituents. At some point, we're, they're not gonna be able to afford it anymore. Um, there was an email sent to us that somebody moved into our district recently from Mannheim Township. They have a smaller home than what they owned in Mannheim Township, and yet their taxes are higher here than when they were in Mannheim Township. That speaks volumes. That What's that? That's an unfair comparison. I don't want to get into all that, but because they have all those businesses down there and we don't have any. I mean, it's just, yeah. But that's beside the point. That's beside the point. We need to, where, so are we saying that we want to move the 600, part of the $600,000? Is that what we're, that I didn't know that was on the table. Anybody else have another one? I think we move all of it. <clears throat> The 600000 just stays in the general fund or goes back to the general fund, wherever it is now. Um, that gives us plenty of cushion space, and we don't really have to cut, necessarily pick and choose what we want to cut. So what I heard from you as the board is that we, administration, business office, will come back 
on the 18th with a 3.25% increase. We will assign at your direction. So I'm going to add a motion from this board to assign $205,000 of fund balance for the 24-25 school year to cover budget shortfalls. Is that agreeable? I believe that's the direction that the board is looking for. Okay. We'll have it done. All right, thank you. And that, thank you. Just one side note to the board, uh, by your policy and uh, PSBA policy, you need five affirmative votes to approve a budget. So it's not, if anyone's missing next week, it's not the majority of those present, it must be five votes to approve a budget. Thank you for letting us know that. All right, we will move on to uh, personnel report. Uh, it's the final action item, Dr. Nell. Yes, the administration recommends approval of the attached personnel report pending the receipt of the necessary paperwork. Second. Any comments or questions about the personnel report? All right, we'll proceed with our roll call vote on that. Uh, Mrs. Maxwell. Mr. Emery? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Mrs. Lindemuth? Yes. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Riegelman? Yes. Mrs. Shrum? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Lindemuth? Yes. All right, uh, personnel report, report passes. Uh, closing items here, just a couple of announcements concerning uh, where we've been and what we've been doing as a board. Tonight, prior to the meeting uh, at four o'clock, we had a tour of the athletic field house and turf project. We walked through the, the field house uh, at the stage it's at and walked around the track uh, to look at that. And then also at five o'clock, we had an executive session that dealt with a safety and security update that is required on an annual basis. Uh, so I believe that has been everything. Uh, we need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you.